The next item of business is debate on motion 12140 in the name of Kevin Stewart on a route map to an energy efficient Scotland. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and can I let you all know that we do have quite a bit of time in hand so I can give time for wonderful contributions or, or interventions. <laughs> And I call on Paul Wheelhouse to speak to and move the motion, which is in the name of Kevin Stewart. Around 14 minutes, please, Minister. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to have the opportunity to open this debate and discuss the important issue of energy, energy efficiency in Scotland. Just a week on from the launch of our route map to an energy efficient Scotland, uh, flowing as this has from Scotland's energy strategy and climate change plan, published in December and February, respectively. This is a good time for our Parliament to examine the challenges and opportunities ahead of us uh, in transforming Scotland's homes and buildings to be warmer, greener and more energy efficient. Improving the energy efficiency of our homes and buildings lies at the heart of achieving this and helping us through cross-portfolio uh, working to deliver mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and meet our, uh, our new all-energy target to deliver 50% of Scotland's total energy needs from renewable sources by 2030. And crucially, as the government's motion sets out, it is essential to invest in energy efficiency if we are to remove poor energy efficiency as a driver of fuel poverty. By improving the energy efficiency of households that are living in fuel poverty, we are supporting our commitment to address the underlying economic and social inequalities in our society and fundamentally helping to make Scotland a fairer country. Of course, as uh, our climate change plan and energy strategy make clear too, Better energy efficiency of our workplaces will also help to improve business productivity and competitiveness. Our latest statistics show that buildings account for almost 20% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So improving the energy efficiency of all Scotland's residential and non-domestic buildings crucially underpins our efforts to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and meet our world leading climate change targets. Our investment in energy efficiency will stimulate economic growth and support jobs across Scotland. Research suggests that a 10% improvement in the energy efficiency of households will lead to a sustained expansion of GDP of around 0.16%, whilst it is also estimated that for every £100 million spent on energy efficiency improvements in 2018, that would support approximately 1,200 jobs. That is why in 2015, if I could make a bit of progress, I'll bring Ms Beamish in later. Th th that is why in 2015 we designated energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority and the route map sets out that the whole economy cost of the programme for public, private and third sectors will be, in today's values, between 10 to £12 billion. Pounds. I'll bring in Ms Beamish. Claudia uh, Beamish. Uh, I thank the Minister for uh, allowing that intervention. And uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, to the Minister the issue around the, the training, and particularly local training, for these jobs. And... Um, would encourage him to make any comments on the opportunities to, to plan for this in terms of the shift to the low-carbon economy. Uh, Paul Fieldhouse. Uh, sorry, sorry, Presiding Officer. <laughs> um, I very much uh, welcome that, that comment. We clearly do want to think very carefully about the labour market impacts of such a major investment programme. And my colleague Jamie Hepburn, obviously as the uh, Skills and Training Minister, will be looking very closely at that issue, that issue on our behalf. There are therefore tremendous Scottish supply uh, based uh, supply chain opportunities that we're determined to develop and support in partnership with Scotland's energy and construction sectors. Our commitment to improving the energy efficiency of Scotland's homes and buildings is not new. Uh, by the end of 2021, we will have allocated over £1 billion since 2009 on tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency. In addition, we have invested over £85 million since 2007 in loans to support Scottish households, businesses and organisations for energy efficiency and renewables measures and the development of district heating schemes uh, supporting over 5,200 applicants in total so far. Our energy efficiency loans to businesses alone have generated since 2008 energy savings of 339 gigawatt hours, uh, carbon savings of 130 kilotons of CO2 equivalent and financial savings of 36 million pounds. We introduced regulations for the assessment and improvement of larger non-domestic buildings in 2016. And whilst these have, will have limited impact on our overall stock, they provide a solid basis from which we will extend regulation across the sector as set out in our route map. Our non-domestic energy efficiency framework and support unit are catalyzing energy efficiency retrofit through Scotland's public sector with a strong project pipeline in place. And this activity working in partnership with local governments and with energy companies has helped to deliver more than one million measures to more than one million households since 2008. This is reflected in the energy efficiency profile of the housing stock with 42% of homes in Scotland in 2016 at EPC band C or better, with this being an increase from 24% in 2010. 
And this year, we've allocated over £146 million to improving the energy efficiency of Scotland's building stock, a real terms budget increase. We remain on track to deliver the 2016 programme for government commitment to make half a billion pounds available for tackling fuel poverty and boosting energy efficiency over the four years to 2021. We want to continue uh, to improve on that record and tackle the over a million homes which don't yet have a good energy efficiency rating of C or better. For our non-domestic buildings, given their diversity and scale, uh, the age and specification, work is ongoing to understand and benchmark the energy and emissions performance across Scotland's non-domestic building stock and how best this can be improved. And through recent reviews of building regulations led by my colleague uh, Mr Stewart and his predecessors, we now set very high standards for our new buildings. A comparison with these standards offers an initial insight into the state of our existing stock. We know that less... Uh, I will. Stuart Stevenson. Um, is the Minister aware that there is a second level benefit for rural dwellers who are dependent on kerosene in that uh, with reduced kerosene consumption when better insulated homes are delivered, they are less likely to require kerosene to be delivered when the weather makes it very difficult to deliver because of snow and road conditions. And that's often of great value to people in the rural areas as well as the primary benefit of warmer homes. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, that indeed is, uh, presiding officer, a very good point that, uh, that uh, Stuart Stevenson makes. I do not depend on kerosene myself, but I know many constituents in Mr Stevenson's constituency and elsewhere in rural Scotland will very much see the benefit of having a lower demand for kerosene and therefore having a greater predictability about uh, having energy security when they are in, in bad weather situations. Um, but uh, through our recent reviews of building regulations, as I say, led by Mr Stewart, uh, we now set very high standards. We know that less than 5% of our non-domestic buildings are close to or better than new build standards and that around 60% of our buildings are less than a third as efficient as new buildings. Indeed, we know that around 10% of our building stock is at least five times worse uh, than the, the new build standards. So this illustrates the very significant challenge that lies ahead for all of us under a new Energy Efficient Scotland programme and why the preparatory work we've already undertaken and will undertake over the next few years is so important. We set out in the climate change plan a bold ambition and that means by 2032 some 70% of heat and cooling for non-domestic buildings will be supplied using low carbon heat technologies. Uh, the Scottish Government is already investing heavily in energy efficiency measures. As I say, we have already committed £500 million of funding in the four years to 2021. Uh, I would remind the Conservatives that there is no equivalent funding available in England, a point not lost on the sector and indeed uh, stakeholders. On launching our route map last week, the First Minister announced that we are allocating £49 million this year alone to our area-based schemes delivered by local authorities. We're also providing £5.5 million of additional funding to support the Energy Efficient Scotland Transition Programme, which will uh, continue to provide a mix of advice, grant and low-cost loans to support property owners over the next two years. And I'm delighted that my colleague Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing, has announced further detail on the Transition Programme, uh, with more than £3.5 million of this uh, funding being made available to social landlords, uh, i.e. housing associations, cooperatives and local authorities, through a new decarbonisation fund. And as well as assisting social landlords in decarbonising their heating, the fund will also encourage innovative thinking and fresh ideas. And as of today, uh, this fund is now open for expressions of interest. This underlines our commitment on tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency for the well-being of the people of Scotland. The Energy Efficient Scotland route map also outlines the framework of national standards that we'll put in place. For homes, it proposes that all of Scotland's homes will have a good rating for energy efficiency of at least EPCC uh, by 2040, with the phasing of this varying by tenure. So, for the private rented sector, we're proposing an earlier target. We're consulting on plans which could see all private rented properties achieve a rating of EPCC or better by 2030. And as the First Minister confirmed last week in her keynote at the All Energy Conference in Glasgow, and I reiterate today, we will be bringing forward regulations to confirm milestones on that journey, requiring landlords of privately rented homes re-letting their premises at any change of tenancy to have their properties first to an EPC band E rating or better, starting from April uh, 2020. And all PRS or private rented sector properties will need to be EPC band D rated or better by 2025. For social housing and leading uh, from, from encouraging progress in the sector, we want to go further. We want to see social landlords maximise the number of social rented homes meeting EPC rating B by 2032. For owner-occupied homes, we want to maximise the number of homes reaching EPC band C by 2030 and will provide uh, support and advice to homeowners to help them to do so. If progress through voluntary action proves insufficient, 
We are prepared, however, to consider what additional action will be needed after that point to help drive change. And I think given the Tories' amendment calls for all properties to meet EPCC by 2030, they have a duty today uh, to explain exactly how they will be incentivised given their tax-cutting agenda would have starved this Parliament of almost half a billion in spending power this year. Alternatively, the Tories should say today how they plan to compel owner-occupiers yeah. to achieve this by 2030. Finally, for non-domestic buildings, we will develop additional standards for non-domestic buildings for 2021 and phase their introduction so that by 2040, all buildings are assessed and improved to the extent that this is feasible. My colleagues Angela Constance and Kevin Stewart are also setting a target date of 2030 for households which live in fuel poverty to achieve a good energy efficiency rating. That's something which will make a massive difference to low-income households. Through Energy Efficient Scotland, we set targets to deliver and monitor progress on energy efficiency in buildings and through framework legislation to be introduced shortly, we will show we are meeting our climate change and uh, targets and ending fuel poverty commitments. Our new climate change bill will set new targets to reduce emissions and our fuel poverty bill will set a new definition and target to end fuel poverty. All of our proposals are founded on extensive stakeholder engagement. From the outset, we have worked with our delivery partners, our stakeholders and other experts to design Energy Efficient Scotland. In parallel with consultation in Scotland's energy strategy, we undertook public uh, consultation starting in January of 2017 on aspects of the programme, including on local heat and energy efficiency strategies, on regulation for district heating, on energy efficiency itself, and on condition standards in pri the private rented sector. Through pilots, we continue to, to co-design the operation of the programme with local government colleagues and national delivery partners. I, I will. Mark Kraskell. Can, can I thank the Minister for, for giving way? I mean, he mentions the climate uh, bill and the targets within that. Of course, one of the targets was around the provision of renewable heat, and it looks like we won't be meeting that target by 2020. So can I ask the Minister what specific actions you'll be taking uh, to deliver that target and, and how we ensure that when we are rolling out uh, district heating that it's decarbonised. Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Certainly, I recognise Mark Ruskell's um, uh, demands for around renewable heat. That's a, clearly a very strong priority for us. We had, had good progress the year before last. We had a bit of a setback with the, uh, the plant at, uh, in Mark Inch having been closed down, which had an impact on the, the overall figures. But I would uh, uh, confirm to Mark Ruskell that we're very much uh, driving uh, to try and still achieve that target by 2020. I have no doubt it will be challenging. We do not have control of all the, the interventions, including RHI. We are consulted on RHI, but we do not have uh, control over it. And we're obviously continuing to engage very recently with Claire Perry at the All Energy Conference around uh, the importance of RHI to us. But I will continue to engage with Mr. Ruskell. I'm happy to meet him to talk more in more detail about that. Indeed, the Scottish Government believes that a long-term strategic partnership with local government is essential if we are to successfully deliver at the scale needed to tackle fuel poverty and reduce Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that is why Mr Stewart and I are placing area-based schemes at the heart of our approach and creating a framework through local heat and energy efficiency strategies to support local government prioritisation and targeting. We believe that local heat and energy efficiency strategies will allow local authorities to design a tailored solution to meet the needs of their areas and identify appropriate solutions to decarbonise the heat supply. Our pilots have funded work to develop the capacity with local government partners to deliver this opportunity. And to date, our, through our pilot programme, we have supported uh, 22 local authorities over 2017-18 financial year and 2018-19, 12 of whom are piloting uh, local heat and energy efficiency strategies, and we aim to support all 32 during the transition programme. These are, there are different paths that can be taken to decarbonise the heat supply in Scotland and across the UK as set out in our energy strategy. And yes, there is uncertainty right now about what the most appropriate pathway will be. This uncertainty is in part caused by the UK government uh, and that mistake, if I can just progress a wee, wee bit, Mr Scott, and I'll bring, I'll bring you in. This uncertainty is caused by the UK government that must take decisions on such issues as the long-term future of the gas grid. There's also a complete lack of certainty over the future of the energy company obligation on a UK-wide basis. And combined with the severely limited scope of the devolved powers available to us, this makes it impossible for us to deliver a version of ECO that would have uh, meaningful benefits for the people of Scotland. I'll bring in Mr Scott. John Scott. Thank you very much, Minister, for taking the intervention. Last night, I couldn't sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning and was aware of the BBC World Service intimating that in California, it's about to become part of the regulation, regulatory burden there on new house builders, that all houses will be fitted with uh, solar panels or uh, photovoltaic panels, and that will be a precondition of getting a planning application granted. Does the Scottish Government have a view on such an innovative idea? 
Paul Wheelhouse. Well, we, uh, we do not have a monopoly on wisdom. We will always look at examples around the world, Mr. Uh, I would say to Mr. Scott. Um, but in terms of solar energy, we very much support solar energy and other uh, renewables at a domestic scale. Uh, it's something that's a matter for Mr. Stewart in terms of building regulations. I don't want to, uh, to overstep the mark here, but, um, but certainly we would be interested in any ideas. But uh, we are certainly looking at trying to make it easier for properties to have uh, renewable energy installations uh, through permitted development rights and other means. And that's obviously one way in which we can support those, those important technologies. Um, but we are working with the UK government and wider academic community and energy experts to identify the right long-term solution or indeed solutions. Uh, we must take the time to research, to evidence and plan our approach so that the people can invest with confidence knowing our route map is, yes, sufficiently ambitious, uh, but also grounded in reality and deliverable. These are very important factors. Our energy efficient Scotland route map focuses on what we can do now, what is certain in a context of much uncertainty in another place. This will mean focusing first on the things we can control, energy efficiency, which underpins our current and future efforts to reduce emissions from our heat supply, and low carbon heat solutions, including district heating, where it is an appropriate solution for the long term. We're also continuing to support low carbon and renewable uh, heat. As announced in the programme for government, we have made a further 60 million pounds available to accelerate low carbon infrastructure projects through our hugely successful low carbon infrastructure transition programme. And this is of course, on top of the 41 million pounds of capital funding already offered in co-investment through that fund. Presiding officer, in conclusion, we are confident the energy efficient Scotland is not only challenging and ambitious, and rightly so, and crucially a deliverable programme. There is no single or quick fix to improving the energy efficiency of and reducing the emissions from our homes and non-domestic buildings. It will take work, it will take effort, and it will take commitment. Energy Efficient Scotland provides a framework of support, advice, and standards that will work together to operate across all parts of Scotland to improve lives. Over its lifetime, Energy Efficient Scotland will transform Scotland's buildings so they are warmer, greener, and far more efficient, and it will support jobs and boost sustainable economic growth in doing so. I move the motion in Kevin Stewart's name. Thank you. I call Alexander Burnett to speak to and move Amendment 12140.1 for around nine minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, there is no doubt across this chamber that the principles of a Scottish Government's route map to an energy efficient Scotland are ones that we all support. At a time when governments across the world are racing to reduce their impact on climate change and communities look to reduce their own carbon footprint, we must all do our part. And with this comes a responsibility to improve on our energy efficiency targets for our Scottish homes. Now, as a keen environmentalist and interest in biomass district heating systems, I have helped reduce many household and businesses' energy bills, improve their energy efficiency, and reduce their carbon footprint. And as such, I refer members to my register of interest, something I know I get a bit of heat about. But I am proud to refer to businesses I own, which provide renewable energy and housing, showing that I was working to improve matters as a member of the public long before I became a member of this chamber. The Scottish Conservatives have repeatedly called for the SNP's energy efficiency target to be brought forward from the current date of 2040. We strongly believe that we can achieve transformative change in energy efficiency across Scotland, with all properties achieving an EPC rating of C or better by 2030. And there is a question mark over the accuracy of the EBC system itself, but I believe that is a debate for another day. However, the Scottish Conservatives recognise the different characteristics affecting rural properties, and so we'll be supporting the Liberal Democrat amendment later, which seeks to improve energy efficiency in remote, rural and island communities. <laughs> Liam MacArthur. Uh, just in, I thank uh, Alexander Burnett for taking the intervention. Just for the uh, interest of clarity, I should um, suggest that um, while I welcome his support, our amendment wasn't selected, so he won't have an opportunity to vote on it uh, later on this afternoon. What a shame. Oh, shame. Uh, Alexander thank, Burnett. <laughs> uh, thank you, but we certainly support the principles behind it, should it have been selected. <laughs> Lou, Mr McDonald. Mr. Barnett's support, as indeed the reference to remote rural and island communities, is in the Labour Amendment, and I will look forward to his support. That was Lewis MacDonald, <laughs> uh, Alexander Burnett. And which we will be coming to later. Um, regardless of these exceptional areas, the SNP's current aim is still 10 years too late. And the existing Homes Alliance have noted that if the SNP brought all homes up to an EPC ban by 2025, Research suggests that it would support 6,400 jobs throughout Scotland, creating a boost for the economy 
as it would raise GVA by 0.27% on an annual basis. And this is not the only reason the 24 target is not ambitious enough, as Labour points out, which is why we will also be, we will be supporting their amendment come decision time. Now, this route map... Yeah, certainly. Paul Wheelhouse. I'm grateful to Mr Burnett for taking an intervention. I would, I'm grateful if he could clarify, given his urging the Scottish Government to take um, more precipitate action, in reference to the UK Government's own clean growth strategy, they make clear its aspiration in a quote, for, for as many homes as possible to be EPCC by 2035 were practical, cost-effective and affordable. There is no firm commitment to do anything by 2025 or 2030, as he seems to suggest we should do. Alexander Burnett. Uh, uh, I think if a minister was listening, I was uh, quoting from the existing Homes Alliance and their suggestion uh, of 2025 and, and the examples uh, and the improvements to the economy, that if we have even more ambitious targets, what that could achieve. Uh, now, this route map looks to reduce fuel poverty by removing poor energy efficiency, but it needs to widen its outlook and ambition on the benefits. The existing Homes Alliance noted that a closer target could reduce fuel poor homes by £245 a year, reduce our gas imports by 26%, and save NHS Scotland between £31 and £52 million. Pounds. Now, the government needs to understand that incentives are key to ensuring residents are quicker to installing energy efficiency measures in their homes. Because whilst local authorities currently offer council tax reduction schemes, a response to a parliamentary question by my fellow member Monica Lennon showed that only six, yes, six properties across Scotland had taken up these reduction schemes over a period of three years. So these current incentives are clearly not working or not being taken advantage of. And so we'd ask the Scottish Government to consider these recommendations by citizens' advice. They found that a prompt council tax rebate should be the headline consumer incentive of a Scottish energy efficiency programme. And their research has showed that a £500 rebate in the year following the installations was more popular than a payout of £100 over 10 years, and we would support this measure. Yeah, certainly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, can, I, can I just remind members that uh, the Conservative, the late member of this place, Alec Johnson, helpfully uh, made an amendment to the Climate Change Bill in 2009 that presided that for businesses, and the Labour Party uh, did similarly uh, for, uh, for private houses. But I think uh, it, it just remains unproven that people are motivated by that, but more fundamentally, not all councils have made much of the opportunity to do that. And I think we all have a duty to try and encourage councils to pick up the challenge of what we legislated for in 2009, rather than perhaps imagining a new bit of legislation in and of itself will make that much difference. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you. I, I certainly support that we all need to do more at, at all levels, whether it's government or council or, or, or our individuals, householders. Uh, but you know, the minister did ask what incentives uh, we, would, we would look at. Uh, and I think I've been talking about the incentives that are in place at the moment that aren't working uh, and what could be done to improve those. And I hope that's a, a constructive uh, point. Uh, well, but, uh, yep. Uh, Kevin Stewart. Mr Burnett has talked uh, a lot about incentives there. Uh, we had uh, recently uh, Tory proposals in the budget to reduce uh, the spending power of this parliament by half a billion pounds. Uh, could Mr Burnett give us an indication uh, of how the Tories would actually pay um, for the incentives that he's talking about? Alexander Burnett. Uh, I think it would be unfortunate to, to push this debate, which would otherwise be constructive, on how we can assist our contributions to climate change uh, by tackling energy efficiency, uh, to rehashing the debate over who could run the economy better, whether it's the SNP's current failure in Scotland in the economy, or whether it's Conservative policies across the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, which are working. So, unfortunately, unfortunately, and not just on the economy, you know, we are having a recurring theme of the SNP that we are living with a cluttered landscape. And so it's no surprise that incentives are difficult constitu for constituents to be aware of when there are so many policy programmes tackling energy efficiency, including the Home Energy Efficiency Programme for Scotland, Energy Efficiency Standard for Social Housing, the Energy Company of Obligation, Scotland's Energy Efficiency Programme, the regulation of energy efficiency in the private sector. And so to remedy this, Citizens Advice Scotland 
have re recommended setting up a one-stop shop approach to tackle this clutter and allow us to build on the best features of these programs. And we need to make it as easy as possible for consumers to install energy efficient measures. But by having one organization provide advice on assessments, incentives and installation, we can help reach our target uh, of an EPC rating of C or better by 2030. Now in the route map, it was detailed that there would be a fund of 54 and a half million for energy efficiency for the year 2018-19. But we believe that additional funding is required in order to ensure it is designated a national infrastructure priority. I won't, I've taken, I've taken more than my share, I think, at the moment. Uh, uh, the WWF and Consu Consumer Futures Unit from Citizens Advice have both called for additional funds to be added to this target if the Scottish Government to meet future targets and ambitions. And therefore, we will be supporting the Green Amendment today, which calls for an acceleration... <laughs> which... <laughs> Thank you very much for, for pointing that out. Uh, we would be, the amendment they had suggested previously would have been one we supported, which would call for an acceleration in the trajectory of public spending in order to achieve our aims. And as the Scottish Conservatives set out in our 2016 manifesto, we believe we need to see the energy efficiency budget gradually reach 10% of the Scottish Government's capital budget allocation. And this would mean capital infrastructure investment rising from this year's 80 million, which currently sits at under 3% of the budget, to 340 million by 2021, meaning a cumulative total of a billion pounds. Now, I note in the route map that they state steps are not set in stone due to the ever-changing of the energy sector. And I would therefore like to ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, to be mindful of those classified as off the grid. And we would look to the government to ensure that sufficient support is given to fuel companies who have a higher proportion of rural residents. And I join calls from the Federation of uh, Petroleum Suppliers for the government to consider a step change approach in the clean growth strategy, as modern high efficiency oil condensing boilers could help reduce both carbon emissions and fuel costs by 30%. Now, as I have outlined today, the Scottish Conservatives are fully behind an energy efficiency program that aims to reduce fuel, fuel, fuel poverty while simultaneously reducing our carbon footprint. My colleague Graham Simpson joined members across the chamber in sending a letter to Housing Minister Kevin Stewart last year detailing many of the points I have raised today on what measures the Scottish Government needs to adopt. And we had hoped these proposals would be considered and jointly repeat our recommendations today. However, we still find the SNP's current programme just not ambitious enough. We must decarbonise the system. We need to take help to take people out of fuel poverty. Consumers are facing a cluttered landscape. Energy efficiency targets will be a decade too late. Fuel poverty proposals are weak. And energy efficiency incentives need improving. The decisions we are making today will affect future generations. And we do not want to be seen as the generation who could have done more. So today, we believe we can do more than what is currently proposed. And Deputy Presiding Officer, I formally move the amendment in my name. I now call Pauline McNeill to speak to and move amendment 12140.4. Around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm moving the Labour amendment, which sits alongside the Scottish Government motion and the Tory motion. They're the only uh, uh, amendments and motions for debate, just for oh. clarification. Um, Labour welcomes the publication of the energy efficiency route map that sets out a series of targets to ensure warmer, greener, more fuel efficient homes and it seeks to reduce the scourge of fuel poverty which blights the lives of so many people and families across Scotland and that we all agree. And at the same time it lays out further steps to meet our climate change obligations. I will be covering mainly housing in my contribution and colleagues will cover the other aspects of energy efficiency in theirs. We agree that we must always help our most vulnerable when we set out policy and therefore there is a huge amount to be done to actively reduce the burden on poorer households who are trying to stay warm and reduce their energy bills. There is a lot we can welcome in the route map to energy efficiency but in truth it has failed to be the ambitious framework that it might have been. It is a missed opportunity in our opinion and we set out to influence in the debate today. We share the view of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and that we do not believe that a commitment to reduce fuel poverty below 10% by 2040 properly represents a commitment to end fuel poverty. We do, however, welcome the new definition of fuel poverty calculated after housing costs, 
But we will leave the timescale is too long, and we agree with the SFHA that a commitment to reduce full fuel poverty below 5% by 2040 or even 10% by 2030 would have been more desirable. What we disagree quite strongly with the government's decision not to include a rural minimum income standard in the new definition. It is quite astonishing that rural fuel poverty does not feature very much in this route map, but yet it has the highest levels of fuel poverty found across Scotland's rural and island communities. The fuel poverty rate for rural households in Scotland is 37%, over 10% higher than the national figure. We do, however, agree with the government that energy efficiency should have, been, should have the status of an infrastructure priority at a point covered by Alistair Burnett. But as has been said by the Consumer Futures Unit for Citizens Advice Scotland, we believe that significantly higher levels of funding would have been commensurate with the designation that would be required to make it a reality as an infrastructure project. This is a missed opportunity. The £54 million announced by the First Minister uh, for the budget to 17-18, 18 is not all new money, and it's rather disappointing that only £5.4 million is, is new funding. The Scottish Government needs to rethink this point. Energy efficiency cannot be taken seriously as an infrastructure, a national infrastructure priority, with only £54 million pounds allocated to it. And I knew that you'd want to intervene in that point, so I will I'll let you do that. Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you. I thank Pauline McNeill for taking intervention. Just for clarity's sake, as I said in my opening statement, there's £146 million pounds being invested in energy efficiency in the current financial year. I uh, appreciate there are different strands of funding, and that may be confusing members in the chamber, but I just want to clarify for the purposes of the debate. Pauline McNeill. Helpful. Um, I think in all of this debate, I think it is quite important to, to draw that together so we can see what, what's going on. But I think we take the essential point is that if it has to be a national infrastructure priority, then it has to look like that. It does look a bit more like that, admittedly, if that's the figure we're addressing. So what are the biggest challenges? According to the existing Homes Alliance, the biggest challenges are owner occupiers who make up 61% of the sector. Roughly half of the home owners have an EPC rating lower than C, but the route plan has no new incentives or financial support for this group to make use of. I think it's one of the, thing, the biggest stumbling blocks to achieving the goals set out in this sector. There are 1,325 households who have made use of a Scottish Government loan over the last year. It is quite a small number. It won't even make a dent in the problem. A HEAPS grant is another option for homeowners, but many will not qualify as eligibility is largely based on income. And we agree with Citizens Advice Scotland that a one-stop shop home for energy advice is essential if we are to make it easier for homeowners to investigate energy efficiency options. I think it's quite a confusing path for homeowners. Most do not associate energy efficiency with climate change reduction, and many have a lack of understanding regarding their options. There is a clear need for much greater promotion of the schemes available, including perhaps face-to-face -face options with owners getting the message that they should get that there are various forms of assistance open to them. Labour has long argued, along with others, that this time I will, yes. Kevin Stewart. Um, uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Ms McNeill for giving way. Uh, I think that we all, all MSPs, could do much uh, to promote uh, the Home Energy Scotland helpline, uh, which provides people uh, from all tenures uh, the opportunity to find the pathways uh, that they can use to improve the energy efficiency of their home. And I would appeal, as I've done previously in this chamber, for all members to highlight um, that helpline uh, in communications that they are making with constituents, whether they be in social housing, uh, private rented housing, or an owner-occupier. Pauline McNeill. I'd be delighted to pay my part in that, but Minister, the essential point is I think that we have good organisations, but it's a confusing path, I think, for many owners. And I think we need to do more to make sure that it comes together. And the suggestion from um, Citizens Advice is it should be a one-stop shop and there should be more face-to-face -to, -face to improve the uptake. Labour has long argued, along with others, that it was time to set a target for the private rented sector to reach EPCC rating by 2025, also mentioned uh, by um, the spokesperson opposite. Tenants in the private sector need strong action to secure better conditions. We're pleased that the government are consulting on this question, but we would hope that the government will have an open mind and consider 2025 as the target, but we'll try and influence the debate when it comes around. 
But at the heart of the debate is the fact that there are over half a million households that cannot afford their energy bills. Hundreds and thousands of houses are poorly insulated. They have outdated heating systems that contribute to rising energy consumption. There are around half a million houses in Scotland with an EPC rating of less than D. And tenants in the social sector have a particular need of assistance. 31% of householders in this sector are in fuel poverty, despite social housing having the most energy efficient stock overall. The SFHA echo this observation, noting that whilst housing associations have the most efficient homes, their tenants tend to be in lower incomes and are more likely to be vulnerable. So I think more needs to be done here. In conclusion, presiding officer, we will be supporting the Tory motion amendment tonight as we agree that the target for all homes to reach APC rating at 2040 is far too far away and we want a much more ambitious target than 2040. So there's nothing else on the table, so we're happy to support 2030 for the time being. Overall, we do believe there needs to be a more ambitious approach to energy efficiency and tackling the question of warmer homes. Due to the extent of the problem, we must be more ambitious as a country. It will simply take too long to make the serious inroads needed in tackling energy efficiency without significantly higher levels of investment. The current financial commitment does not adequately reflect the fact that energy efficiency is meant to be an infrastructure priority. I call on the Scottish Government to up their ambitions in this regard and make it a real national priority. Thank you. Colin Mark Ruskell, um, around four minutes, please, Mr. Ruskell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, can I start by declaring an interest as a homeowner who's benefited from a recent uh, government energy efficiency loan, perhaps one of the, I think, 1,300 uh, people who've benefited in the last year that uh, Pauline McNeill outlined. Um, and can I welcome uh, this debate coming so quickly after the launch of the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme? Um, but it's clear this is the start of scrutiny on this plan, not the end of it. And all the drafted amendments, including the uh, ghost ones from the Greens and the, and the Lib Dems, underline the level of cross-party consensus between all opposition parties to see this ambition raised further. And I think there is a majority in this chamber for increasing the ambition, maybe not right now, but there might be at five o'clock. So I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, WWF for helping to forge that consensus. Um, but also to the Greens Head of Research, Ian Tom, who has been so effective in his cross-party work over the years that he's sadly now leaving us to work for everyone in a new role in SPICE. I'm sure everybody will wish him well in that. Now, we've all repeatedly extolled the triple bottom line of energy efficiency in this chamber, and it seems to be the best tool in the box we have to lift hundreds of thousands of families out of fuel poverty, create thousands of skilled jobs while slashing carbon and building resilience in our energy system. And as the challenges of driving climate change action grow in the years to come, we may well look back at these debates and wonder why a bit of universal lagging and draft proofing seems so much beyond the reach of our society. But we can't rely on building our way to success either through building standards when 80% of our homes are already built. We have to tackle the here and now. And I think as a number of members have already uh, mentioned, SEEP has to create the right motivation, especially for owner-occupiers because we can all get too used to working around the difficulties of living in a poorly insulated house, unwilling or in many cases unable to take the opportunities to make our lives flow a little better in a healthier home environment. And the research by the Consumer Futures Unit and CAB should guide the SEAT program going forward, because what does upgrading to a category C rating actually mean for a householder? How is it actually going to make your day a little better and the incentives need to be there too. So members have mentioned the, the need for a strong financial cash back in year one. That's something that might help somebody buy that sofa or fix a door that needs replacing. It can improve our well-being. And the scheme has to be accessible. And my personal experience of using Heaps has been that it's clunky and bureaucratic. And I can't actually explain how it works to my neighbors, my constituents, or crucially, my local joiner in under a minute. And there is a confusion around the plethora of failed Green Deal, occupancy assessments, EPCs, plus you add into that the offers that come down the phone and through the letterbox on a monthly basis. So the one-stop shop concept is good, but it needs to be simplified further and actually built on. Now I want to turn briefly to budgets, and uh, this is as much a message to Mr. Mackay as it is to Mr. Stewart. 
And it's clear that the £137 million in this year's budget needs to be substantially increased if we're to get the vast majority of homes up to Category C by 2030. Now, the existing Home Alliance have pitched that we need to be spending around £450 million by the end of this session of Parliament. And it's clear that multi-funding commitments are important to build an effective long-term approach. It will add certainty to, certainty to the market, helping to lever in public private sector funding, and it will lead to better workforce planning, a point I think Claudia Beamish has already raised. Hopefully that's going to mean new apprenticeships and college courses to train and retrain workers. Now, last year's programme for government pledged to spend half a billion pounds on tackling fuel poverty and energy efficiency through SEEP over four years. Annual budgets must now reflect the status of energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority. The engineering might not be as visually iconic as the Queen's Free Crossing and you can't drive across it, but the infrastructure we spend most of our lives in is four walls and a roof. And our homes have the power to improve our well-being and enable us to thrive, but only if we invest in the future today as a strong national infrastructure priority. Good try, Mr. <laughs> I'm sensing a wee bit of um, sympathy for Mr. Ruskell because it appears I only let him speak for four minutes. Can I give the explanation that I've agreed with Mr. Ruskell's group that he can split his allocation between opening and closing? So, for everyone else, it's as um, everyone was already told. I therefore call Liam MacArthur for around six minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy President Officer. It wasn't sympathy for Mr. Ruskell, it was mild panic on my own part, I have to say. Uh, but anyway, I, I am uh, delighted to be taking part in the, in the debate and welcome the publication last week of the Energy Efficient Scotland route map. And welcome the fact that we've got an early opportunity uh, to debate the important issues it, it raises. As I think has been acknowledged by most, if not um, all, of the main stakeholders with an interest in this area, the proposals set out in the route map uh, do represent, I think, an important step forward. Equally, however, uh, there's a risk that uh, this comes to be seen as a missed opportunity for eradicating the scourge of fuel poverty and achieving our climate change objectives, unless more ambition is shown in a number of key respects, both amendments being debated this afternoon, as well as the uh, two that didn't make the cut, unfortunately, uh, I think make a contribution in addressing that risk. And for that reason, Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, will be supporting uh, both the Conservative and the Labour uh, amendments at decision time this afternoon. Uh, the case for greater urgency in achieving our targets for improving the energy efficiency of all our housing stock is compelling. So too is the need to back the welcome inclusion of energy efficiency as a national infrastructure, uh, infrastructure priority with the sort of funding that will make that designation meaningful, a point picked up uh, both by Polly McNeill and Mark Russell. And the Colin Labour's amendment for greater ambition on fuel poverty is one uh, obviously that we would strongly agree with. Indeed, uh, this was very much the focus of the amendment uh, I lodged um, uh, and the area in which I want to concentrate the remainder of my remarks. As colleagues in the chamber will scarcely need reminding, I have the highly dubious honour of representing the constituency with the highest level of fuel poverty uh, and extreme fuel poverty anywhere in the country. Uh, being off the gas grid, uh, facing higher energy costs, uh, not least because of a, uh, an unfair surcharge, with longer, harsher winters and more hard to heat properties. The reasons for Orkney's uh, finding it, uh, ways, uh, sorry, the reasons for Orkney uh, finding itself in the position uh, it finds itself in are not hard to understand. I'd also, though, wish to pay tribute uh, to the coalition of different organisations locally, all of whom demonstrate a great commitment uh, and no little ingenuity in finding ways to tackle the problem of fuel poverty in our islands and providing a bit of a one-stop shop that I think was reflected again in Polly uh, McNeill's uh, comments. But it's not easy, particularly when the circumstances they face are different to those found in other parts of the country and don't conform to the expectations underlying funding programmes or regulatory requirements. That is why I was so pleased uh, when the government agreed to set up a standalone fuel poverty task force for the rural areas uh, under the chairmanship of the highly respected Di Alexander, someone with a deep knowledge uh, and real passion for tackling fuel poverty in rural communities, certainly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, Alexander Burnett helpfully referred to some difficulties for the current uh, household rating system. And certainly my house, cosy as it is, cannot get down to, uh, to see. So will he recognise that perhaps in uh, the amendments that are 
present for the government motion, uh, it actually is impossible with the current definition unless we are able to revisit the definition and share a common goal to make everybody in a cosy, affordable home. But the present EPC system just doesn't work well enough. Liam MacArthur. I think Stuart Stevenson makes a, a valid point. It's one I've, I've made as well, that in, in relation to many of the properties found in my own uh, constituency, there will be challenges there. But I think unless we are more ambitious than the, uh, the, the targets we, we set, uh, we run the risk uh, of falling far short of where uh, we need uh, to be. Um, uh, as I say, I think uh, it's, uh, it's why I was pleased, as I say, to see the task force um, uh, set up by the, uh, by the government. It spent over a year taking evidence uh, and reflecting on the particular characteristics and drivers of uh, rural fuel poverty coming forward in October 2016 with an action plan to deliver affordable warmth in rural Scotland. This plan set out sensible, realistic, uh, practical actions to, quote, make it significantly easier for people living in rural and remote Scotland to keep their homes warm. In making the case for rural proofing any policy on fuel poverty, the task force explained that, quote, rural and remote Scotland has a population of one million and is characterised by a multiplicity of small, scattered and often hard to reach communities which bring additional policy, service delivery, cost and funding challenges. Sadly, there seems no evidence at all that the route map launched by the First Minister last week has been rural or indeed island proofed. If it has, it raises serious questions about whether or not this process is meaningful or little more than a tick box exercise. I appreciate that word count is hardly, in a second, I appreciate that word count is hardly a reliable gauge of anything, but the lack of reference to rural in the route map is a bit of a giveaway, and I give way to the Paul Wheelhouse. For, uh, for taking a brief intervention. I just would wonder if he could perhaps at least uh, acknowledge that, as I set out in my opening statement, we've got interim targets for the private rented sector and social housing, which were well in advance of the deadlines he is mentioning. And of course, in rural areas, as he will know in his own area, as I'm sure in, in the south of Scotland, much of the rented market is taken by private sector rented accommodation, and we're prioritising that early in the period. Liam MacArthur. I know the points he makes. Actually, what I'm teeing up to go on to is the definition of rural fuel poverty rather than the uh, EPC designations. More substantially... Excuse me, Mr MacArthur. Could Mr Wheelhouse and Mr Carson stop having a private conversation, please? There's a coffee line Mr outside. MacArthur. Uh, more substantively, however, is the government's failure to accept that using a single minimum income standard for determining fuel poverty in both urban and rural areas is inappropriate. Di Alexander and his colleagues were explicit in their report and have reiterated the message in response to the government's revised definition of fuel poverty that any minimum income standard would need to be uprated by between 10 and 40 per cent to reflect the higher costs of living in rural, remote and island areas. Worryingly, the Minister has chosen to ignore this recommendation as well as the subsequent advice from the Fuel Poverty Definition Review Panel, which called for a, quote, specific remote rural enhancement to the new MIS income threshold. It simply makes no sense for the government to acknowledge the rural dimension of, to fuel poverty, set up a task force to develop proposals, and then simply reject key recommendations made by those experts. And I don't believe that this is an issue uh, that breaks down along party lines either. I am almost certain there will be MSPs on the government benches, perhaps even the minister himself, who represent rural constituencies or regions and who will feel similarly confused and uncomfortable with, an appro with the approach being taken uh, by the minister, Mr Stewart. To make matters worse, the redefinition of fuel poverty and use of a single minimum income standard will allow the government to claim fuel poverty rates in rural areas at around 20% rather than the average of 35% at present. So, at a stroke, without any additional funding or any new policy intervention, ministers would be able to claim that they had achieved their fuel poverty target for 2030. This clearly is nonsense. No one surely thinks it is credible or represents a sensible way of addressing fuel poverty in our rural communities. Yes, there is a need to target resources more effectively at those most in need of help. And I absolutely accept that programmes brought forward by successive administrations with the best of intentions have often struggled to make a difference for some of those in the greatest need. However, using such a blunt instrument, failing to recognise the specific dimension to fuel poverty in rural and island areas, and ignoring the advice of those with real-life experience and expertise is not a recipe for being any more successful in future. 
The Minister and I, or certainly Kevin Stewart and I, are due to uh, meet to discuss this issue next week uh, on the back of amendments I lodged to the Islands Bill, itself the legislative expression of the Government's commitment to ensuring policy and lawmaking take proper account of island needs and circumstances. I would be happy to cancel that meeting and return for confirmation, either by uh, Paul Wheelhouse or by the Minister himself this afternoon, that they are prepared to accept uh, the Task Force's recommendation. Deputy Presiding Officer, as I said at the outset, the route map does represent an important step forward in improving energy efficiency to tackle fuel poverty and climate change. However, we no, fall short Mr. In MacArthur, I think you should close. <laughs> we need to see a cross-party commitment to press for change. Thank you. I'm beginning to understand why Mr. MacArthur was panicking at the idea of being cut down to four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we now move to the open debate and it's uh, speeches of around six minutes. Please, I have a little bit of time in hand for interventions. I call Graeme Day to be followed by John Scott. Presiding officer, uh, the route map on energy efficiency published last week by the Scottish Government shows welcome commitment to improve Scotland's housing stock, the investment of £54.5 million as part of that wider, I think, £146 million, the Minister said, will help people to stay warmer, assist those in low incomes and help ensure that we play our part in tackling climate change. It perhaps won't surprise the Chamber that, given I'm the convener of the Parliament's Climate Change Committee, I want to focus my speech on that last aspect, because in climate change terms, this is meaningful news. In designating energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority, as it did in 2015, the Scottish Government acknowledged the role it has to, uh, to play in tackling climate change. And now today we have a debate around something which will have such a major impact on our climate change efforts, which drew uh, two ministers and a cabinet secretary, none of whom are the cabinet secretary for climate change, to the front bench, which I think emphasises the point made often in this chamber and in the work of the Climate Change Committee, that all ministers must be and ministers, actually, all ministers and cab secs in this government must be climate change ministers and cabinet secretaries. If Scotland is to respond fully to the challenges posed by climate change, then all of its MSPs, all of the committees of its parliament and all of the portfolios of its government need to be dialled in. And the route map on energy efficiency, backed as is by the, the, the cash mentioned earlier, is evidence of that happening, as indeed is this debate. As was identified in the climate plan, this energy e efficiency programme will not just save consumers money, but also support thousands of jobs, creating a substantial domestic market and supply chain for energy efficient and renewable heat services and technologies and related expertise, which can transfer to international markets. The uh, low carbon and renewable energy sectors already support, I think, 49,000 jobs in Scotland. Moreover, every 100 million spent on energy efficiency improvements in 2018 is estimated to support approximately 1,200 full-time equivalent jobs across the economy. Making sure we act to tackle climate change is therefore good news, not just for the planet, but for our economy and jobs. And, um, Tackling energy efficiency uh, is a key area requiring attention, as evidenced by the fact Scotland spends £2.5 billion every year either heating or cooling buildings, which represents more than 50% of our annual energy use. Including those helped in 2017-2018, almost 1,200 households benefited from the Home Energy Efficiency Programme. So for Scotland, another £116 million has been allocated in this year's budget, with the aim that by 2020, 60% of walls will be insulated. And I want to return to heaps in a moment. As was noted in the Committee on Climate Change's 27 progress, 17 uh, progress report, domestic buildings accounted for 13% of all emissions in 2015, and 5% came from non-residential buildings. Significant progress has been made in reducing emissions in Scotland. A billion homes and non-domestic properties have been improved since 2008. But I think everyone here recognises we must go further. And this is what further looks like with a route map setting out the course to reducing emissions from all buildings to as near zero as feasible by 2050. I hear the calls for quickening the pace. I sympathise with some of these calls, but what I'm not hearing is how this will be incentivised and funding, uh, funded, and that's important. Sitting alongside this, of course, is the need to move to renewables. In 2017, it's estimated that the equivalent of 68% of gross electricity consumption came from renewable sources, up 14 percentage points. Uh, from 2016. Whether we're looking at wind, waves, solar, tidal or other renewable technologies, they have a role to play. But ultimately, improving energy efficiency will be pivotal to ensuring that, that we green the energy-related element of the economy. Presiding officer, as MSPs, it's important we just, uh, if you don't mind, I want to I crack on if I may. Uh, as MSPs, it's important we don't just talk the talk in here, but we walk the walk. So last summer, 
having previously replaced old radiators and had a new central heating boiler installed in my family home, I re-insulated my loft. Something of a physical undertaking, I have to say, but the difference it's made to the warmth of a 26-year-old house has been pronounced. So I can stand here today saying, say, uh, implementing energy saving measures isn't just the right thing to do morally, it's also good for the pocket and our comfort. I might also add that um, I have also switched to a green electricity su supplier uh, sourced entirely from renewables, but I, I reckon doing that might be pushing uh, my luck. I could be open to accusations of self-satisfaction and perish that thought. Um, can, I, can I move on to make the point? I think it's in, uh, vital that we get maximum bang for our buck when investing public money in energy efficiency measures. And I've seen an example in my own constituency where such an opportunity perhaps wasn't fully exploited. A couple of years ago, Angus Council secured over £1 million funding under the HEAPS ABS scheme to externally clad privately owned houses which lacked wall cavities. They identified clusters of such properties in our Broth, Forfar and Montrose. But rather than focusing on a single location, or maybe two, and squeezing the maximum return from that sum, they decided to do a number of houses in each location. The net result in our Broth, in my constituency, was that just 30 homes were addressed with a number of properties left out of the project. It was a similar story elsewhere. I was told that a further transfer money would be applied for under the scheme the following year, and if successful, the council would pick up where they'd left off in all three towns. But that would have, of course, have involved in moving back into these areas with all the costs of re-establishing the footprint need to, needed to carry out the work eating into the budget. Smarter thinking would, I'd argue, have made money go a little further. And on that issue of smarter thinking, can we encourage, please, a more holistic uh, thinking when it comes to implementing measures which are aimed at reducing emissions and carbon footprint? We will all of us have heard uh, or have come across examples where home insulation, uh, insulation, for example, is being uh, carried out by firms that have travelled considerable distances to carry out one-off pieces of work. I'm aware of, uh, of one example, presiding officer, where properties just outside Aberdeen, just north of Aberdeen, had loft insulation installed by firms that had travelled from Elgin and even further afield, such as in Inverness. Um, can those charged with delivery under these, of these schemes please give some thought to shortening the supply chains and through that reducing transport emissions? Finally, presiding officer, Angus course, uh, South is of course a partly rural constituency uh, and I recognise some of the points that we and MacArthur made. We must make sure that our energy efficiency schemes are open to and uh, publicised to those in rural areas. Presiding officer, we face a big challenge in terms of tackling climate change, but take that on, we must, and this plan from the Scottish Government has an important role to play in ensuring that our buildings are front and centre in this, as they require to be. Presiding officer. John Scott, followed by Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I begin by declaring an interest as a homeowner and an owner of property which I lease? Can I also welcome this debate today following the government's publication of their energy efficient Scotland route map last week. Can I note too that while all parties share similar objectives of achieving an energy efficient Scotland, each party has a different route map on how to get there. So, presiding officer, let us look briefly at the scale of the task ahead and start with housing where 1,490,000 homes in Scotland have a lower than C EPC rating. Of these, 420,000 homes have a banned E, F or G rating, with only around 50,000 homes currently being upgraded to a D rating or above each year. In addition, almost 1 million homes with D, E, P, C ratings or lower are owner-occupied. And this is where a major challenge lies in terms of improving our housing stock, as the Minister Paul Wheelhouse has already noted. Regrettably, at the moment, most owner-occupiers are not installing energy-efficient measures and are making do with what they have. And while this problem is bad enough in our towns and cities, it is worse in our rural areas, where peripherality contributes significantly to the problem. Graham Days just mentioned it. And so while getting skilled tradesmen is difficult enough in our towns and cities, it's much more difficult and expensive in rural Scotland if they exist at all, and these energy inefficient homes in both town and country lead to respiratory and other medical problems, mental health problems, and cause and contribute to the daily growing demand on our NHS. Indeed, regrettably, World Health Organization research sadly suggests that in the winter of 2016-17, 
30% of winter deaths in Scotland could have been avoided if people had been living in warm and adequately insulated homes. And I can only speculate, no thanks, not just now, and I can only speculate that winter deaths this winter just past will have been still greater than the year before due to the severity of the winter still not over in much of rural Scotland and self-evidently this will have been worse among the elderly and those living at home. Christina McKelvey. John Scott for taking that intervention and I hear what he says about winter deaths. Could maybe John Scott tell us how much of the proportion <coughs> of those winter deaths were down to the fact of people on universal credit who couldn't heat their homes? I don't, I, John Scott. For, of course I thank you for the intervention but I think that's a debate for another day. So presiding officer, this is why we are disappointed by the lack of ambition in the government target to raise all homes to a C rating by 2040 as it's costing lives and contributing to overflowing hospital wards and bed blocking. Spend to save used to be one of the Scottish Government's policies. I well remember John Swinney and those benches extolling that as a policy. And given the cost of extended stays in hospital for elderly patients relative to the cost of upgrading an energy inefficient home, making homes more energy efficient truly wins hands down every time. So instead of the government's target, of course. Paul Wheelhouse. Always is a gentleman. Um, I appreciate the point he's making, but we are obviously committing over 500 million over the four year period up to 2021 in energy efficiency in Scotland. There's no such scheme in place uh, at UK level for, for England. I wonder if he would reflect on that in, in calling for more ambition here. His colleague, Mr. Burnett, did not answer that point. Well, uh, John thank, Scott. Thank you for the intervention. And I will, of course, reflect on what you say. Um, so instead of the government's target of 2040 to upgrade all homes to a C rating or above Scottish Conservatives want to see this work completed universally by 2030, 10 years earlier, spending now to save lives and reducing health cost services at the same time. And that's where you get the funding from, Minister. Turning now to how the delivery of warm homes could be better achieved, we, look, we need to look at more than just funding. We also need to change attitudes to fuel poverty in the minds of not just landlords, but also in the minds of owner-occupier homeowners, where not creating energy-efficient homes is a truly self-inflicted wound. I probably fall into that category. So government schemes, such as the council tax rebate scheme, need to be changed to create a better uptake and perhaps front-end loaded, as suggested by Citizens Advice Scotland, whose research suggests that a £500 one-off council tax rebate in the year following the installation of energy efficient measures would be more popular than a rebate of £100 per year for 10 years. It's certainly worth a try, Minister, and perhaps both schemes could be run in parallel to find out which might be the more popular. So, presiding officer, returning to the route map for an energy efficient Scotland, Scottish Conservatives want to see the government go further than they appear to be prepared to do at this time. We want to see better incentives to encourage people to help themselves, which will require better regulation and more support, and which may include subsidised loans to install energy efficient measures. This will also require the government to better promote such schemes as the uptake of existing schemes for home owners has been poor. We will need to raise awareness of the availability of future support for improving EPC ratings, and the government must show leadership and determination in seeking to deliver these targets. In old-fashioned parlance, there is a selling job to be done to local authorities, housing associations, to make them aware of the incentives that are on offer to improve their housing stock, and Pauline McNeill uh, suggested that as well. We need to make individual home owners better aware of what they might do to help themselves rather than leave all the communication to the many nuisance telephone calls and messages left on Callminder from ambitious companies trying to sell either new double glazing windows or boilers. Hard to reach elderly rural homeowners must be approached perhaps on a face-to-face -face basis as I think Pauline McNeill suggested and made aware of government ambitions differently from cold calling, which in my view drives some potential customers away. We must do more to eradicate 
fuel poverty, again all too evident in local authority housing stock. So if we can achieve warmer, better, more energy efficient homes, the prize is huge. Better physical and mental health will happen as surely as night follows day. Our constituents will have a significantly better quality of life. And this is why we in the Conservative Party so want to move this upgrade forward as quickly as possible. Go to it, Minister, and you will have our support. Call Christina McKelvey, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I share and celebrate the moves that Scotland has already taken and is committed to advancing through the route map launched last week. And it is more important than ever that we position ourselves as, a, as trailblazers, not only in our alternative energy sources, but in making sure that it is commercially viable and people can actually afford it. The Grand Plan is a visionary projection. As such, it sets out the kind of infrastructure and efficiency improvements that the Scottish Government is committed to delivering. delivering. We've heard a lot of that this afternoon. And I particularly welcome the commitment to ending fuel poverty. And we do need better insulated homes, and the schemes available do that and make some progress. However, it doesn't matter how well insulated your home is and how many projects you've taken part in. If you've not got the money to switch the heating on, then you're in a terrible situation. But, and there is a very important but, presiding officer, I have been working in my constituency, Hamilton, Larkhorn, Stonehouse, with families who are in fuel poverty, such that children either eat or go cold, or eat cold food. People who request a cold bag at the food bank because they have no means of cooking the food in a fuel rich nation, not acceptable. And I'm talking about our most vulnerable groups of people here, the sick, the elderly, those with special needs, children and babies, and those so infirm that they can barely able to move for themselves. I've met them all, they're all real people. And more recently, those who are on universal credit. Rolled out in 2016 for single men, rolled out in 2017 now for families in my constituency. Some I know spent most of this winter wrapped up in many layers of clothes and blankets as they could get because they couldn't get out of their homes for the cold. The pensions and allowances that they now receive are not adequate to keep themselves both warm and fed. Think about that for a second. Working families often find themselves in the same predicament, and more so now since October 2017, since universal credit's been rolled out. Children are expensive to feed. I know I couldn't, can't keep my boys fed. They're expensive to clothe and keep warm, but parents shouldn't need to choose which essential they get that week. The increasingly obvious devastation brought on by Tory cuts and the introduction of universal credits leaves an ever larger number of people unable to pay for ordinary household expenditure, including the energy to warm their homes. Fuel poverty is not about to become a, a curse of the past, but we have to plan to eradicate it for our future, and this route map goes some way to do that. The visionary aim of the, fruit, the, the route map to 2040 is to eliminate fuel poverty by that time. I would like that quicker, everybody would like that quicker, but we have to plan for that. But we do not let that, don't, don't let that target blind us to the pressing need for communities like mine. And that's why I'm glad to see that vulnerable people and people who are in fuel poverty are the first targets in this route map. The here and now is a reality for my constituencies. This is families enduring ever-reducing and ever-limited resources, and they try to survive on these. These are my constituents in Hamilton, Lark, Hall and Stonehouse, and I want to share with you a real-life intervention and the difference that it actually makes. So myself and an SNP councillor for Lanark, Julia Mars, set about establishing a scheme to persuade energy retailers that they could offer innovative ways to help combat fuel poverty. Scottish Power signed up first and with a real commitment that the company should be recognised for and are delivering today and I am very grateful to them for that. Now we have eight different agencies providing variations on what is called the Quick Credit Voucher Scheme. We introduced it initially right across the UK, not just in Scotland. The scheme started in Hamilton, Kirluk and Birkenhead food banks late last year, just about the same time as Universal Credit rolled out for families. It offers a £49 winter, winter voucher, credit voucher, and a payment for those in danger of being disconnected or those who have no means to warm their homes or cook their food. And the Scottish Power says, and I quote, the idea of the scheme is that it is, is not customer-led it is led by the partner agency spotting the requirement and assessing when and, to, uh, when and how, who to promote the scheme to. The company has partnered with food banks, citizens' vice bureaus and community energy projects. Households don't have to pay anything back and they are entitled to three payments in a 12-month period. 
I am very happy, President Officer, but I am also very sad to report that so far the Scottish Power Scheme has given 172 quick credit vouchers through Hamilton's Food Bank and 52 in Clydesdale. Sad because so many needed it in the first place. More retailers are talking to me now and I continue to encourage private sector buy-in as a way of highlighting their corporate responsibilities and their commitments. I am firmly convinced that this kind of innovative and straightforward community-led support scheme is the right approach for our most vulnerable groups. And I continue to encourage energy suppliers to share that responsibility to help those in full poverty uh, like this and a similar type of programme across some of the other energy companies that are already being developed. So to someone trying to keep an elderly relative or a baby warm, that £49 is far more important to that person and any family as these are the people who are in immediate crisis. The ones not answering the calls, the ones not opening the dreaded letters from the energy suppliers, the people who need it now. The Scottish Government's commitment to £1 billion over 22 years to eradicate fuel poverty is a welcome advance. I have to make the plea for people who are in crisis. The improved infrastructure is welcome, but we do need that crisis intervention. It's that practical money in my hand relief that makes sense when you're struggling. And I have been confronted with families who have been handed that £49 and you would be not surprised to hear the impact that has on people. The emotional impact, but the fact that they can go home and be warm for at least another month. The difference is amazing. Here is a meaningful miti mitigation presiding officer that draws together the big energy providers who don't actually have a good reputation in most cases for some people, but they have a good reputation in this. They work with local communities like in Hamilton, Larkhall and Sto Stonehouse and ultimately everywhere else in this country because I'm hoping this will become a nationwide scheme and we're working towards that. Longer term. I hope that the Scottish Scotland Social Security Agency proposals will have examined how best to manage existing fuel poverty until the wonderful day when we, that no longer exists. I want claimants to be assessed as part of the processes that their energy needs and the risk of them having fallen into or deeper into fuel poverty is addressed through that assessment process at the early stage. Presiding officer, I truly, truly welcome this route map. It's a journey that we're on, we're all on, we all want more, I understand that and I look forward to a day when a warm home is something that everyone has irrespective of their personal financial circumstances. I call Claudia Bimish to be followed by Gail Rose. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the publication of the route map as we do across this chamber. Nobody in the chamber denies the process of optimising our housing and building stock for a low carbon future will be difficult. The Scottish Government's route map moves us in the right direction, but it is insufficient, in my view, on counts of both detail and funding in the longer term. In terms of climate change, in the latest greenhouse gas emission statement, the Scottish Government frankly brushed aside criticisms of its failure to, um, of rising emissions in the residential sector with cries of cold winter, specifically in the residential sector. Somewhat of a circular argument because cold winters cannot be used as an easy excuse. It surely demonstrates how tough cold winters would have been for those vulnerable to fuel poverty and the absolute need for stronger and more immediate action. The Minister and the convener of my committee, Graham Day, both highlighted the climate change plan and how this underpins the route map. Strong ambitions in energy efficiency measures could deliver multiple benefits, reducing household bills, alleviating fuel poverty, improving health, creating economic and employment benefits, and reducing the sector's carbon emissions, 1.6 million tonnes of CO2 in 2015. It is vital that energy efficiency improvements go hand in hand with low carbon energy technologies. Scottish Renewables have highlighted their concern in their briefing that the proposed measures on district heating networks are not strong enough with only a small beneficial impact and at best, and that it fails to engage off-grid areas, a real concern in my region of South Scotland. It is also very disappointing to see that the Scottish Government allowed the proportion of heat generated by renewable sources uh, to fall in 2016, and this needs to be a priority now. I know the Minister has... Yes, I will. 
Paul Wheelhouse. I, I, I share the member's concern to try and address the renewable heat targets. I'm not taking away from that. But would, would Claudia Beamish accept that we can't control the uh, success or failure of private sector schemes, including the one at Mark Inch, which unfortunately, uh, through the closure of the paper mill at, at Mark Inch, uh, went out of commission at that point? Claudia Beamish. I do take that point, and I'm going to come on to um, uh, the private rented sector as well um, later in my remarks. Um, if we're to tackle fuel poverty in a just and fair way, there must be due regard to the specific circumstances of such a wide range of people uh, in Scotland today. I have long been concerned about those living arrangements where energy efficiency measures are more complex, such as in private rented accommodation um, or in multi-occupancy buildings. And in 2014, I proposed an amendment to the Housing Act to introduce a provision on energy efficiency standards in private rented uh, sector properties, including those in multi-ownership buildings. This did not receive the support of the Scottish Government at that time and fell. But the buy-in from owner-occupiers is crucial. And in these cases, um, which are more complex, I would very much welcome comment from the now Minister in his closing remarks as to the Scottish Government's plans for those people in these circumstances where cooperation and indeed shared funding uh, uh, feeding into a, a collective pot or, or, or such um, may well be required and legislation might be required for this. Um, there has, there's already been significant action, as we, as we know, on, from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations who have been leading on, on these issues. As their briefing reminds us, members have already made significant progress in increasing energy efficiency in our homes and in developing innovative approaches to providing affordable warmth, such as renewable heating and district heating. And they've also set up their own not-for-profit um, energy company. And I do recognise the fund that the Minister has highlighted on this today, uh, but, but point out that the Scottish Association for Housing, um, Federation for Housing Associations is calling for more support. Uh, and so, with many, to many more with um, low incomes, which, where we must prevent uh, fuel poverty uh, and other forms of fuel poverty, further action is needed. And I want to highlight our amendment in this respect. Representing, as I do, rural South Scotland, like the Minister, there are a significant number of my constituents living in fuel poverty. And in 2016, as we've already heard, but I stress again, 37% uh, of rural dwellings are in fuel poverty compared with uh, 24 of urban dwellings. And I am utterly mystified as to why the Scottish Government national document on energy efficiency can have zero mention of the words rural, remote or island. And Leah MacArthur has highlighted this um, issue very robustly. It is more expensive but, uh, as well living in, on islands where uh, it's difficult in terms of actually taking the materials and the fuel um, by boat. And I think that there should be um, a minimum income that should be different for rural and island communities. And I hope that um, the minister will consider this. Uh, the cost of alternative fuel becomes more manageable if people can buy at times when it's cheaper. And it is currently seems unlikely that the, the, fuel, the winter fuel payment um, is going to be brought forward to, to be able to be um, accessed earlier, even for this coming winter. And I do ask the Minister to look at this again, because both Borders and Dumfries and Galloway are having serious issues in, in my constituency. And I also thank Age Scotland for highlighting the stark statistic of uh, six in ten single pensioners live in fuel poverty. Uh, so this is important as well. In terms of financial support, I ask the Minister to consider how the Scottish National Investment Bank criteria could help the Scottish Government's plan to decarbonise heating in homes and businesses and bring jobs to local communities through their criteria. And in this context, I want to highlight area-wide projects. Today I've highlighted some of the specific circumstances in which people find themselves vulnerable to fuel poverty, but this is something everyone in Scotland will have to consider. And I, I support Pauline McNeill's call, which also other members across the chamber have argued for, for a one-stop shop. I find it confusing as a rural dweller uh, when I'm trying to investigate what I should do to better 
um, insulate my home and, and, and do all the things that we need to do. Uh, and, and that's sort of my brief. So I think it's really important that it's done appropriately. So the UN affords us the right, finally, to adequate housing. Here in Scotland, this must mean a warm home today and for future generations. So a national infrastructure priority deserves more. Thank you. Uh, just before I call Gail Ross, can I say we've eaten up most of the extra time now, and I think um, all groups have had a, a fair shot at that. So if we could stick to the six minutes from now on, please, that would be useful. Gail Ross to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, uh, President Officer. The Energy Efficient Scotland route map sets out a programme to improve energy efficiency and, in so doing, will help achieve our priorities of tackling climate change and reducing fuel poverty. It will also improve the day-to-day -day lives of people across the country, making their bills cheaper and their homes and places of work more comfortable. Businesses and public sector providers will also benefit. The energy savings they make from increased efficiency could be reinvested in their services or their workforce. And it's a testament to the Scottish Government's commitment to making these improvements that energy efficiency has been designated as a national infrastructure priority since 2015. However, the area has seen investment in action from this government since long before then. Between 2009 and 2021, the government will have allocated over £1 billion on improving energy efficiency and tackling fuel poverty. Though the investment to date has been significant, I think we all agree that there still is much to be done. And that's why the Energy Efficient Scotland takes a long-term approach to energy efficiency. And the route map's vision is that by 2040, Scotland's homes and buildings will be warmer, greener and more efficient. And this will be achieved by setting long-term mandatory energy performance standards for all buildings and using a phased approach which recognises the different building sectors will be starting from different points and improving at different paces. I was particularly pleased to see that the route map makes clear that those making the transition to greater energy efficiency will be offered good quality independent advice. In my constituency, as I'm sure with others, there is a real issue with cold calling relating to energy efficiency. And companies will falsely claim that constituents are required to make changes to their homes under the pretense of a government scheme. And this can often have grave consequences as individuals make unnecessary changes to their homes at great expense. And I'm hoping that the Minister will confirm in his closing speech that the advice provided will help to raise awareness of such fraudulent practices. I was also pleased to see that the ambitious target of the route map proposed to maximise the number of homes in the social rented sector to achieve the EPCB rating by 2032. In the Highlands, a large amount of social rented housing stock is prefabricated or constructed by a method which makes houses hard to heat. I would also be interested to hearing from the Minister in his closing what challenges he believes that there may be in, in improving this type of housing stock to the desired standard. Improved energy efficiency can help some of the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society by removing poor energy efficiency as a driver of fuel poverty and Christina McKelvey outlined this perfectly in her speech. The Fuel Poverty Bill, which will be introduced later this year, will set statutory targets to eradicate fuel, fuel po poverty. And the government's most recent consultation on the issue sets out a framework to show how these targets will be achieved. It will also help us achieve our climate change targets across households, buildings and public services Around £2.5 billion a year is spent on heating and cooling the buildings that we use. Scottish Government statistics show that buildings account for nearly 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. Improving efficiency is therefore crucial to tackling climate change. And the Government's climate change plans, which several members have already spoken about, sets out the policies and proposals that will keep Scotland on course to reach our 2050 target of cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. But implementation will not only tackle just these two issues, it will have wider economic, social and health benefits. It will improve people's day-to-day -day standard of living, it will make bills more affordable, as I've said, and it will make our homes and places to, that we work in more comfortable. Improved energy efficiency will not just assist existing businesses, it could also help create them. And the rollout of the Energy Efficient Scotland programme could create a substantial Scottish market 
and supply chain for energy, energy efficient services and technologies. As the route map shows, every £100 million spent on energy efficiency improvements in 2018 is estimated to support approximately 1,200 full-time equivalent jobs. To conclude, presiding officer, I want to raise an example of what energy efficiency can do for my own constituency. And this particular example was actually included in the Energy Efficient Scotland route map document. In 2012, Ignis Wick Limited purchased the assets of the failed Wick District Heating Scheme and took over its operation. It invested £2.5 million in a biomass steam boiler to replace the existing oil fuel boiler. It reduced fuel costs and secured heat to supply 165 homes, including Old Pulteney Whiskey Distillery. Ignis continued to invest in the network with assistance from the Scottish Government's District Heating Loan Fund and subsequently the Green Investment, Investment Bank and Equitix acquired the site. The network now supplies 200 homes, the Highland Council's assembly rooms, the distillery and Caithness General Hospital. And this shows exactly what on a larger scale energy efficient Scotland can achieve. Tackling climate change and fuel poverty, improving energy efficiency in homes, public buildings and businesses, promoting growth and investment and reducing bills for residents. And I want to say to Graham Day, if he wants to talk about travel distances, I'll see his Elgin to Aberdeen and I'll raise him a Glasgow to Wick. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Finlay Carson, followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Carson, Th please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Improved energy efficiency could go a long way to alleviating fuel poverty, particularly in rural areas. Last year, my colleague Graham Simpson, along with other MSPs, wrote to Kevin Stewart regarding energy efficiency and fuel poverty. And they said priority should be given to fuel poor households, particularly in remote and rural communities. This is something I too would have liked to have seen in the government's route map for energy efficiency. However, the route map published last week says nothing about rural homes. The SNP government have failed to seriously address the issues energy inefficient homes present for rural residents. Uh, not at the moment. The SNP government says that they are committed to removing poor energy efficiency as a driver for fuel poverty. However, their lack of ambition to eradicate fuel poverty in Scotland by only committing to reduce it to less than 10% in 2040 just isn't good enough. The link between better insulated, warmer, more efficient homes and fuel poverty cannot be clearer. A target of achieving EPCC for all homes by 2040 is laudable enough, but I'm sure the residents of 420,000 premises currently related in lower EPC bands of E, F and G who have not had uh, to spend, will have to spend 22 more winters in freezing homes right across Scotland. They'll not agree uh, with the government. They'll agree with me when I say that these targets are simply not ambitious enough. The route map also fails to outline the practical means by which households are expected to achieve energy efficiency by 2040. No, no thank you. This SNP government has not committed new funding for energy efficiency. With new uh, homeowners not being encouraged to take measures to make their homes more energy efficient, coupled with a lack of adequate regulation, there is a great risk of this crucial se sector flatlining. This presents significant problems for social landlords who have been asked to increase energy efficiency while not also increasing rents. Homeowners are also being asked to improve their homes without uh, incentives on offer. Existing Home Alliance Scotland have outlined uh, that these uh, must be in place long before the target deadline approaches if we are to achieve the government's target, reduce carbon emissions, tackle fuel poverty and achieve the transition to an energy efficient Scotland. In addition, as a member for Galloway and West Dumfries constituency, I know how many constituents like mine could benefit from renewable heat technologies. That is why I was dismayed to see that the government's route map did not make the most of opportunities for the renewable heat industry, especially given that it is not on track to meet its 2020 renewable heat target. While the route map confirms emission reduction targets, it contains very little detail on how these targets will be achieved. It is welcome that the government are preparing to support some district heating, though they have failed to engage off-gas areas which is a major missed opportunity for rural communities given the cost effectiveness of renewable heat technologies. It's essential that technologies like smart electric heating, heat pumps, biomass and solar are taken advantage of to ensure that the heat we generate is both used in the most efficient way as well as being low carbon. 
So I'm calling on the government to commit to providing future support for these technologies, given that the current funding will run out in the next three years. Moving forward, I would encourage the SNP government to think about how new technologies can be included in promoting energy efficiency in an up-to-date, modern manner. Finally, it's clear that if we're going to become energy efficient, we must make it clearer to households and businesses what they need to do. The installation of energy efficiency measures must be made as straightforward as possible for consumers who should be able to immediately enjoy the many benefits of energy efficiency. Organisations, as already touched on by my colleague Alexander Burnett, uh, including uh, uh, Citizen Advice Scotland, have indicated that the biggest challenge to a transformation uh, in energy efficient Scotland will be the improved standards of energy efficiency and owner-occupied properties. Buy-in from owner-occupiers is critical in achieving energy efficiency targets, but at present homeowners are not installing energy efficiency measures fast enough. It's clear that this government must work harder to, be, to make, uh, work harder to highlight the many benefits of installing these efficiency measures to encourage owner occupiers to improve their homes. In order to achieve this efficiency, it's also essential that consumers have confidence and trust in any government schemes. I know of constituents of mine that have struggled with these energy schemes. One woman in Dalry struggled to secure new heating and installation before winter set in and the timescales on our heap loan ran out owing to supplier delay. And then the recommended suppliers said her property was too far away and there was insufficient manpower to carry out the work. The recommended supplier then went to the wall and many of the other companies who could have carried out the work were based in central Scotland. In another case, a contractor who installed the heating system went bust, leaving my constituent with an unusable heating system and no recourse. These cases highlight the work we have to do in order to truly achieve an energy efficient Scotland with the benefits still to be felt by far too many people who simply do not have the required information. Thank you very much, Mr. Carson. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr. McPherson, please. F thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm, Presiding Officer, I'm very pleased to speak in this uh, important debate as a member of the cross-party group on renewable energy and energy efficiency and the cross-party group on housing, but most of all as a constituency MSP and to warmly welcome the Scottish Government's Energy Efficiency Scotland route map. When I was standing for election uh, after a public meeting, I remember very vividly that a young lad came up to me and said, Ben, it's great that all the new houses are being built, but don't forget about the older homes like mine that are sometimes still too cold and damp. I think of that conversation often and I think of it today and I think of him and too many like him in my constituency and elsewhere in Scotland who live in buildings that are currently too inefficient and absolutely need improvement. It's historical decisions by a range of different political parties that have taken us to where we are today and it will take all of us to work together with others, with stakeholders, with local authorities to make the difference that's needed. I welcome that energy efficiency has been a priority for the Scottish Government uh, before this, this route map with the SEEP scheme, the HEAP scheme, the Warmer Homes Scotland programme, which I've seen delivered in my own constituency through Warmworks. And this new energy efficiency Scotland route map will build on that. With 54 and a half million pounds, the route map will play an important role in furthering the Scottish Government's efforts and all of our efforts together to tackle fuel poverty, as well as reducing carbon emissions and protecting the planet for future generations. Because let's remember that 53% of Scotland's energy consumption currently goes towards heating and that buildings account for 19.7% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I started by talking about my constituency and I'm sure many of you will appreciate that Edinburgh Northern and Leith is an urban constituency. Indeed, it has some of the densest urban areas of the whole of Scotland. And a significant challenge that's already been touched on by other speakers when it comes to our current stock and ensuring that by 2040, current buildings are warmer, greener, and more efficient, is how we enhance that current stock to the same standards of new buildings and uh, those in the, the social rented sector, for example. Others have touched upon the challenges with owner occupiers and also the PRS. And one of the most important 
and widespread areas of housing stock that is within those two sectors is that of tenements. Now, I led a debate here in Parliament in January about tenement repairs and, and maintenance. And I thank fellow members from across the chamber for their, their support with that motion and, and in that debate. And I think I'll just be clear, because sometimes tenement, the word tenement makes people think of certain parts of, of different cities. But let's remember that under the Tenement Scotland Act 2004, a tenement is defined as a building or part of a building which compromises two related flats that are designated to be in separate ownership and are divided from each other horizontally. So this is half a million homes in Scotland, a quarter of Scotland's current domestic housing stock. So how we manage, enhance, improve, repair our tenements is absolutely key to rural Scotland, urban Scotland, and absolutely to energy efficiency. I declare an interest as somebody who, who owns a, a tenement, but it's not just my own personal experience, but those, of course, much more, it's about the, the, the casework that I've received as a constituency MSP that's driven me to try and take action on this. And I know colleagues have had the same correspondence. And actually, since that debate in January, there's, I've received e emails from all, all over Scotland about this issue. And the problem is that uh, there was a talk uh, from another speaker earlier about uh, how, how it's some owners are unwilling or unable to undertake works. And when it comes to shared property within a tenement, whether that be the roof or the common stair, there are real challenges about how individual owners mobilize themselves to undertake works. And that's why, together with other MSPs across the chamber, including Graham Simpson, we have collaborated to bring together a working group of experts with MSPs to look for new solutions and how we enable owners and encourage owners not just to repair the current tenement stock, and there is absolute need for that, not just to maintain the current stock, and there is absolute need for that, but also to enhance it. And I raise that to issue today because enhancing our tenement stock can make a remarkable difference to how we deliver the aspirations we have around energy efficiency. So, I will conclude, presiding officer, by saying that this working group is up and running. This working group is looking for solutions. This working group is open to other MSPs who want to be involved. Because if we want to help tackle climate change, tackle fuel poverty, and enhance our rural and urban environments, then enhancing our tenement stock is really important for that. It's about improving quality of life. And I hope the government will continue to be open to that working group as we come forward with new solutions. Thank you. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Angus Macdonald. Mr Rowley, please. Presiding officer, I very much welcome this debate today and the route map brought forward by the Scottish Government to transform Scotland's buildings to become warmer, greener and more efficient. The fuel poverty roadmap is a step in the right direction. In particular, it is welcome that the government are consulting on regulations to require private rented sector homes to be rated energy performance certificate C by 2030. However, it fails to live up to the government's promise to make energy efficiency a national infrastructure project with no significant financial commitment a lack of any detail on how homeowners can improve their energy efficiency of their homes and no mention of the unique struggles faced by rural communities across Scotland. In other words, it is a map that shows you where you want to go but is short on detail of how we are going to get there. I believe we must be more ambitious when it comes to ending Scotland's fuel poverty shame. Yep. Minister. For taking intervention, I'll keep this brief. I just want to emphasise that a number of members have referenced the, the, the lack of specific reference to rural, uh, rural housing in the document. We're talking about initiatives to help 100% of properties in each property category in terms of private rented and the various categories. So I hope that helps explain why that is the case. We're trying to deal with 100% of properties, and that obviously, clearly, as a rural member, includes my own constituents and Mr Rowley's. Alec Rowley. I do, I do think that, that given the impact of uh, rural 
fuel poverty, which I'll say more about, then it, it needed to be in that document far more, and that's perhaps something the Minister can address. But as Age Scotland has said, almost six in ten single pensioners and four in ten pensioner couples live in fuel poverty in Scotland, with those in rural areas most affected. Age Concern uh, Scotland continues to be concerned at the continuing prevalence of excess winter deaths with 2,720 recorded in 2016-17. There was a significant increase in excess winter deaths among people aged 85 and over with 1,430 additional deaths compared to 970 in 2015-16 according to National Records of Scotland. Indeed, the World Health Organisation estimate that around 30% of these excess winter deaths could have been avoided if everyone in Scotland lived in a home that was adequately insulated and heated. Is that not why this Scottish Parliament was created? To be able to tackle these big social and economic issues impacting on people of Scotland? Scottish Labour are committed to ending poor energy performance as a driver of fuel poverty, and we believe the government's proposals fall short in a number of areas. Scottish Minister's designated energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority in 2015, but the level of funding available pales into insignificance compared to funding for other infrastructure projects. There is a commitment to continue funding fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes and to continue multi-year funding, but no new or additional monies is planned. The plan provides barely no detail on how the government will support private landlords and homeowners to reach the targets outlined. If householders are to be active participants in improving the energy efficiency of their homes, financial and fiscal incentives are needed. One such suggestion comes from Age Scotland, where they call on the government to explore whether improvements uh, in order to meet energy efficiency standards should be eligible for a reduction on their council tax. I would merely suggest we need to look at how we're going to support people if we seriously want to eradicate fuel poverty from Scotland. It is deeply worrying that there is no mention of rural homes in the roadmap, uh, which we've discussed, and they face unique challenges in preventing fuel poverty because of their use of off-grid fuel. We have asked the government to give priority to fuel pure, poor households, particularly remote and rural communities. As Scottish Renewables said in their briefing, the roadmap has little detail on how the programme will accelerate the rollout of renewable heat, particularly in off-gas grid areas, which we regard as a missed opportunity given recent policy changes and the eventual closure of the renewable heat incentive in 2021. Labour has called for a Warm Homes Bill to tackle fuel poverty, and we welcome the SNP's commitment to take this forward. However, the Warm Homes Bill has been renamed the Fuel Bo Poverty Scotland Bill, with no guarantee that will, it will include provisions to improve energy efficiency. The Minister might want to answer this point in closing. The recent announcement by UK Labour to invest 2.3 billion pound per year to provide financial support for households to insulate homes and for local authorities to drive up and deliver uh, insulation schemes show the scale of the ambition that is needed. We recognise the benefits that this would bring not only in terms of fuel poverty but also in terms of jobs and the economy. Last year, Labour signed a letter along with other opposition parties in this Parliament calling on the government to, among other actions, establish a goal to end poverty, poor energy performance as a driver of fuel poverty, set a target to get the vast majority of homes rated at EPCC by 2025-2030, and prioritise fuel poor households, particularly in remote and rural communities. So, presiding officer, the message today must be that this is us on the right track, 
but we must be far more ambitious if we to end the blight of fuel poverty in Scotland. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I call Angus Macdonald, be followed by Graham Simpson. Mr Macdonald, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in this afternoon's debate and welcome the publication of the Energy Efficiency Scotland route map as it provides a long-term framework to plan and implement strategies. And there's no doubt our buildings need to be comfortable to live and work in and heating them should be affordable. So this route map will address this. Now, I was particularly pleased to see district heating mentioned in the route map, uh, which reiterates a separate Scottish Government proposal to introduce a package of regulatory measures to support district heating. Now, district heating was first mooted for the town of Grangemouth in my constituency way back in the 1950s. However, we're still waiting, um, but a new major system is on the horizon. Uh, the proposal back in the 1950s was to harness the gas being flared off from the stacks at the oil refinery to provide cheap heating for the town. Uh, sadly, it never came to fruition at the time, due mainly, I think, to a lack of vision. Uh, however, it is most definitely on the cards again. Exciting plans have been developed which could hopefully see a district heating network in the town producing low-cost heating for industry and local households, particularly parts of the town with low-income households. The ambitious uh, Grangemouth Energy Project is a team effort involving Falkirk Council, the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise and major companies in the town, all thanks to a task force set up in 2013 to assess the potential impact of the threatened closure of INEOS. Uh, which took up the challenge of finding out if a more resource efficient, low carbon, low cost energy solution to cut costs <coughs> facing local firms and householders could be found. A comprehensive appraisal of heat and power demand to tackle serious concerns about the cost burden facing businesses in Grangemouth, uh, Grangemouth Industrial Complex identified a wide range of power generation options, including industrial heat recovery, geothermal heat recovery, and gas fired combined heat and power. For the district heating element of the project, the benefits included the potential socio-economic benefits coupled with the carbon emission reductions through the reuse of waste heat. Unfortunately, just in the past couple of weeks, INEOS has pulled out of the plans to develop a, a district heat network which would have benefited the local community. It still will. Um, but INEOS have made alternative plans to, pro to, pro to provide energy at their plant, which is understandable but disappointing. So I would take this opportunity, presiding officer, to urge INEOS to engage with the local community more in the hope that the firm can contribute positively to the local community over and above being an employer, albeit a major one, but also be a good neighbour to the 18,000 people who reside in Grangemouth, cheek by jowl, with heavy industry, day in, day out. Uh, so taking part in the district heating scheme would have helped them ingratiate themselves with the local community. But uh, despite Ineos's departure from the scheme, Falker Council is hopeful other major players will come on board uh, because this is too good an opportunity to waste. And of course, when it comes to district heating, we can learn much from our Nordic cousins across the, the North Sea in Denmark. Way back in 1979, Denmark passed its first heating supply law. And although there have been several revisions, it's still in effect today and has resulted in many years of act active energy policy, systematic heating planning and regulation. And looking ahead, district heating systems remain a key element of the energy system in Denmark. By 2020, about half of the Danish electricity consumption will be supplied from wind power, which has increased the focus on flexible district heating and CHP systems using, for example, heat storage, electric boilers, heat pumps, and a bypass of power turbines to support integration of wind power into the energy system. So there's clearly much still to learn from Denmark. Now, turning briefly to climate change, clearly uh, improving tackling the issue is vital for achieving our ambitious climate change targets. We know that Scotland has cut its greenhouse gas emissions by around 40% from 1990 to 2014 and met its statutory emissions reduction targets for both 2014 and 2015, with the data on Scottish emissions in 2016 due to become available next month, which will hopefully be just as good. So that's all well and good, but there's clearly much more to do, especially when you take into account the fact that buildings account for 19.7% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So with the action proposed to ensure that by 2040 all homes are improved so they achieve an energy performance certificate rating of at least C, then there's going to have to be a significant programme of retrofitting. Now clearly with regard to retrofitting, I think in closing, presiding officer, it's only right 
to highlight the issue flagged up by Age Scotland, that there will need to be substantial dedicated funding for incentives to match any new standards, particularly for older people who own their own homes and are asset rich but remain cash poor. And Age Scotland rightly highlight that interest-free loans may not provide a sufficient incentive to undertake the necessary work. So Age Scotland have come up with a suggestion worthy of consideration that the government should explore whether owner-occupiers carrying out improvements in order to meet energy efficiency standards should be eligible for a reduction or rebate in their council tax. So I'll just leave that one sitting with the Minister, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. And Mr Stevenson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Simpson, please. Thank you. Um, there can be few more important subjects than the standard and condition of Scotland's homes. Last year, myself, Alex Rowley, Mark Ruskell and Liam MacArthur wrote to Kevin Stewart on energy efficiency and fuel poverty. Um, now, I grant you it was a rather odd alliance, uh, but we were, and I think still are, at one in our belief that more needs to be done. We pointed out that the target for the elimination of fuel poverty by November 2016 was missed and that 35% of Scottish households are in fuel poverty. We called for the elimination of poor energy efficiency as a driver of fuel poverty. We called for credible fuel poverty and climate change goals. We noted the recommendation of the expert fuel poverty strategic working group that all fuel poor homes should be brought up to at least an EPC band C rating by 2025. We called for all fuel poverty programs to be rural proofed as recommended by the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. We said that the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme should have an interim target for the residential sector of supporting the vast majority of homes uh, for those for which it's technically feasible and appropriate to reach an EPC band C rating by a date in the range of 2025 to 2030. And we said priority should be given to fuel poor households, particularly remote and rural communities. We also supported efforts to work with the UK government to improve the assessment methodology that underpins the EPC to improve its accuracy and called for improved quality assurance of EPC assessments as they have been to hit and miss. So how does the Energy Efficiency Scotland programme published last week fair when set against this cross-party ambition? Let's take each of those asks in order and see how the uh, so-called route map stands up. First, the elimination of poor energy efficiency as a driver of fuel poverty, and second, all fuel, fuel poor homes should be brought up to at least EPC uh, C by 2025. The program commits to the first, but is there enough in it to give us any confidence that it will deliver? No, there isn't. What we have is a consultation, this government's very keen on them, and a proposal to get poor fuel households to EPC B by 2040. Now, it's safe to say that not a single government minister will still be in post in 22 years' time, and most of us, and most of us, most of us will not be MSPs. So talk about, kick, talk about kicking the can down the road. The commitment to have fuel poor homes at EPC C by 2030 is not as ambitious as the target we called for. Why not? Added to that, we have dark warnings from stakeholders that the much heralded warm homes bill may be dropped in favour of a watered down fuel poverty bill which won't deal with energy efficiency. I hope my information is wrong on that, yes. Minister. Sorry, I, I'm grateful to the member taking intervention. On that point, just to clarify, we have a fuel poverty focused bill coming forward, but we do intend to bring forward further legislation on tackling energy efficiency and warm homes. So, so we assure the member on that, but we're on the first phase of a two bill process. Uh, yes, the, the, there was a manifesto commitment for a warm homes bill, and I'm not clear from that answer whether that uh, is still going to happen. Yes. Mr. Minister. Make, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I thank the member again for taking intervention. Just to be clear, we are obviously working, going through a process of working out the best method of tackling district heating, local heat and energy efficiency strategies with COSLA and other stakeholders. And we do intend to bring forward further legislation which will address the points he's raising in, in making our homes warm 
efficient, energy efficient and tackling fuel poverty, but we're focusing on the fuel poverty target at this stage. Mr Simpson, I'll give okay. you the time back. Thank, thank you very much. It's just not, not quite the same thing. However, third, rural proofing. The route map says nothing about rural homes. A number of members have mentioned this. This is a clear failure. Current proposals for supporting people in fuel poverty ignore the recommendations of the Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Working Group to take into account the higher costs of living in rural areas when targeting uh, fuel poverty support. And fourth, uh, that the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme should have an interim target for the residential sector of supporting the vast majority of homes to reach an EPC band C rating by 2025 to 2030. Now, the majority of homes in Scotland, we've heard this already, 61% are owner occupied. So the question is, how are you gonna get those homeowners to upgrade their properties, a million of which are below EPC C? And here the program is particularly lacking. There's another consultation, why not, might as well, the government uses the phrase, we want to continue to encourage and enable owners to take action. Any suggestion of anything stronger will be left to the, quote, later stages of the programme, whatever that means. The plan does not say in any detail, well, if I'm going to get the time back again. Yes, if you wish, if you went to the Minister. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to, uh, in my opening remarks, I made clear that we would uh, look at 2030 as being a point if we had not achieved our target to bring owner-occupier properties up to EPC standard C or better by 2030 through voluntary action, we would look to have further methods to actually compel uh, that to happen thereafter. But I have not yet heard from the Conservatives how they would achieve their earlier target without compulsion or any incentive uh, that's credible. Mr Simpson. And, and what the Minister didn't say earlier, and perhaps he can say later, is what that further action uh, might be. Um, the Scottish Government is kicking the can down the road again. And it's a road that takes until 2040 to travel. I tend to agree with Citizens Advice Scotland that you need to make things easy for people. So a one-stop shop approach should be considered. You can't force people to do things to their own homes, but you can enthuse them to want to and offer them things like meaningful council tax discounts or low-cost low loans and grants. Finally, uh, the EPCs should be more robust. Now, I'm glad the Scottish Government has finally agreed to look at EPC methodology. It cannot be right that someone can assess your home without even seeing it and giving it, give it a rating, and it cannot be right that two people can give the same house different ratings. That is the current position. I want to mention one more thing, and that's the condition of our existing homes. The route map doesn't deal with this. Many of Scotland's homes are ageing and crumbling. Ben McPherson mentioned this earlier. And the government hasn't got a clue what to do about it. It's been left to those of us across party who can see the problem to form a working group along with experts. Uh, and we will be coming up with proposals. Deputy Presiding Officer, I do thank you for the extra time. Energy efficient Scotland is a missed opportunity. We need to do better. Well, you did take interventions and we did have some time in hand, so it's only fair. I call Stuart Stevenson, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Uh, th th thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I'm grateful to Ben McPherson. I now know that I have tenements in my constituency. I hadn't previously uh, twigged that a block of four houses on two floors um, sharing a common stair would, uh, would qualify as a tenement. So I will go away and have a wee look at uh, the implications of that. Uh, uh, in, 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 in future. Uh, and indeed, it has been an interesting debate in all sorts of uh, interesting ways. I want to just uh, pick at a few wee things. And uh, one of the ones which we've spent comparatively little time debating is district heating. And we recognise that the, the, the targets previously set look unlikely uh, to be met. And in particular in the North East, we have perhaps a unique opportunity, and that is geothermal heating. Um, I had the privilege as a minister to visit a, a, a stagecoach bus depot uh, to see their uh, geothermal heating. They had two boreholes, went only 100 metres down uh, uh, to uh, enable them to pump water down to the bottom of the hole and get it back up, and it heated uh, this large garage where 
even with snow on the ground and the doors open, it was really too hot inside the garage. Now, the cost of doing that uh, about 10 years ago was something in the order of £40,000. Um, not a huge amount of money for a heating proposition uh, for a, a, a bus uh, depot of that kind, but considerably more than I think most domestic uh, people would consider investing. But on the other hand, start to think of uh, perhaps 10 houses uh, sharing uh, such a facility, and you start to get into the realms of economic possibility. I, however, in looking at the subject, find that there are some practical difficulties, and that is in the subject of way leaves. In other words, taking utility supplies across other people's uh, property. And way leaves, statutory undertakers can get way leaves, and they are rail, light rail, tram, road transport, water, port, canal, inland navigation, dock, harbour, pier, lighthouse, um, airport operator, and supply of hydraulic power. But one of the things that's missing from the list of statutory undertakers is suppliers of heat. So therefore, in uh, looking for a way leave to transport heat from one place to another, you don't appear, on my research, uh, to have available the way leave condition. Now, I have heard from uh, a, uh, a, the t Mitchell and Tyres in Dundee who wanted to transport heat that that proved to be a difficulty. So I think there's a legal issue. I'm also uncertain as to whether this may also still be a reserve power. And I'm unclear about this, to be absolutely candid. Uh, we have powers under Section 9 of the Electricity Act 1976, uh, which allows us to legislate uh, for the liquefaction of offshore gas. But none of the other powers that might cover this appear to be uh, devolved. But there is a lack of clarity, and my research is not necessarily final uh, or complete. So I think there are some opportunities for looking at how we might uh, make district heating, particularly in the Northeast. We have one very good example in Aberdeen, but it's quite a different uh, character. Uh, but I think we have other opportunities that we might look at. Oh, and geothermal isn't just a Northeast issue, uh, although Mons Grampus and the granite that therein provides particular uh, opportunities. Um, I am um, going to join uh, uh, Gail Ross in outbidding Graham Day when my wife got uh, uh, our uh, insulation in our uh, roofoid taken from 200 millimetres up to 600 millimetres uh, in rural Bamshire. Uh, they came from Lanarkshire to do it. But I outbid her because they had to come twice because they didn't bring enough material the first time, and my wife wouldn't let them in the house until they turned up with enough. Uh, so they actually had to do that journey twice. So I claim precedence uh, over uh, Gail Ross. But there is a serious point inside uh, putting that insulation in, in a rural single-storey uh, dwelling, which is never going to be EPCC because of the way it's constructed. Um, it, uh, it, it more or less cut our fuel consumption, which is kerosene, uh, by 40%. Just the simple act of putting that insulation. In fact, it took us a full week tweaking the thermostats and the radiators to get the temperature down to an acceptable uh, level because we were roasting uh, with that additional insulation. Where that sort of intervention uh, to be installed in all rural houses, that I think would be great. The government has done a great deal of that. It was a government-funded scheme. It didn't cost us uh, anything at all. Uh, let me just uh, finally, presiding officer, uh, talk about tax incentives. We've had a number of comments on that. I just return to the intervention I made earlier in the debate uh, that we did have in the 2009 Climate Change Act, which I had the privilege of taking through Parliament, we did put climate, uh, uh, tax incentives for uh, improving your, your, your house, but it relied on councils bringing forward schemes. Not all of them by any means did so. In fact, I'm not sure that very many of them did. Uh, so the track record of tax incentives based on houses is at the moment showing a not proven verdict, I would suggest at best, uh, as a, 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 way, uh, a way forward. Um, and I just end, presiding officer, by saying I'm a wee bit disappointed that the Tories are seeking to delete from the government motion uh, that the whole economy 
uh, gets a £10 billion value. I would have thought the Tories would have been quite interested in that sort of number. I certainly am. Go to it, Minister. Thank you. Officer. And I move to clo closing speeches. I call Mark Ruskell, please, for the Green Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, two minutes at hand and two brief reflections on this debate. Um, the first one is that, to members' contributions, I think it's clear that SEAT needs to address the real lived experiences of people suffering fuel poverty across Scotland. I think we heard very powerful speeches from Ben McPherson, Christina McKelvey, about the kind of innovation that we need to tackle fuel poverty in our communities, whether that's joined up support between food banks and energy companies, whether that's the kind of innovation that we need to see around the development of tenemental properties. But we have to get Get the communications right and I was shocked to hear the answer to Monica Lennon's question in this debate that only six properties received a council tax rebate on energy efficiency in the last year I find that absolutely incredible we have to get the communications right now a number of members talked about experiences lived experiences of people in rural communities Liam MacArthur Claudia Beamish Graham Day Finley Carson many others of course, particular challenges there, the cost of fuel and transport, the challenges over retrofit with older stone-built properties in off-gas areas. I would ask ministers to reflect on that, reflect on the point that Pauline McNeill made about the rural minimum income standard. We need to have a SEAT programme that doesn't mask rural poverty. It needs to address the specific needs of rural communities. The second point I would make, and it was an interesting challenge that the minister threw down at the beginning of this debate, I think primarily to our uh, colleagues over there in, in the Tory party, but it was about, you know, if, if we don't meet the aspirational targets for 2030, we are going to have to move towards regulation. I was very then pleased to see uh, John Scott uh, jump up and extol the benefits of high regulation in California and compulsory solar panels. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, you know, reach out to the Tories and say, you know, we need to have a strong consensus here to continue to drive the government and continue to drive them to be bolder in the strategy. And it does mean a commitment to appropriate regulation to drive the kind of progress that we would all like to see. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruskell. Colin Lewis MacDonald, close for Labour, six minutes, Mr. MacDonald. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government's aspiration was set out this afternoon uh, by the Minister quoting its vision statement uh, from the Energy Efficient Scotland route map. By 2040, our homes and buildings are warmer, greener and more efficient. And I think it's fair to say that every other speaker has endorsed that aspiration. But what we have debated this afternoon is how much warmer and greener, how much more energy efficient, and do we need to wait until 2040? This is not a new policy area for Scottish ministers. It has been a devolved responsibility since 1999, and every government has pursued the same policy objective of greater energy efficiency. What is new, ministers would say, is that energy efficiency is now not just a policy objective, but also a national infrastructure priority. I think we all agree that a step change is now required, and the designation as a national priority would seem to imply that a step change is now to be delivered. Mr. Wheelhouse certainly confirmed a continuing commitment and further steps the government intends to take. He did not, however, in our view, demonstrate that those steps will deliver at a sufficiently greater scale or pace than what has gone before to justify uh, that designation. The government's route map identifies a desirable destination. It is 20 years from now. It provides a number of milestones along the way and it confirms the targets for emissions reductions, for example, set out in the climate change plan. But as Scottish Renewables have said uh, in relation to uh, the route map, it contains very little detail on how to achieve uh, those aims. The document also rightly identifies that energy inefficiency is a driver of fuel poverty, and it rightly commits to earlier milestones in relation to fuel po poor households. There is, again, though, little by way of detail as to how that is to be achieved or how uh, progress is to be defined. An energy efficiency programme without an ambitious target in fuel poverty is at best incomplete. And we believe that the government need to be clear about what they intend to achieve and by when. Their consultation last November suggested targets on reducing the numbers in fuel poverty to 20% of the population by 2030, 10% of the population by 2040. Our amendment urges ministers to be more ambitious about ending fuel poverty uh, and sooner than that implies. As Liam MacArthur and Claudia Beamish uh, both highlighted, and indeed Alec Rowley, it is disappointing that there's no, not a specific recognition in the programme of the particular challenges 
uh, facing remote rural and island communities, although uh, Paul Pillai acknowledged those early in the debate. Fuel poverty and energy efficiency are at their highest in the remotest places, and they're high everywhere that is off the gas grid. Those communities do not have access to the affordable and reliable mains gas for heating and cooking, which many households in urban Scotland take for granted. Precisely for that reason, rural Scotland is where energy companies could and should be encouraged to deploy innovative solutions which can improve energy efficiency and affordability while reducing carbon uh, uh, emissions. I acknowledge the Minister's point about the benefits of targets on private rented homes, for example, for many rural areas, mm -hmm. but an explicit priority for all housing in those areas would have been widely welcomed. There are innovative things already happening in urban Scotland, it's been mentioned by a number of speakers, not least the district heating networks established by Aberdeen Heat and Power over the last 15 years, reducing both energy costs and carbon emissions for many hundreds of households in Aberdeen which used to live in fuel poverty. So the work being carried forward separately by ministers to further enable district heating is welcome, as are other funding streams supporting interventions in other Scottish cities. All of those policy streams can work together, but they need to be joined up, which is where a national infrastructure initiative uh, can help to deliver, if indeed uh, it achieves that. Uh, a number of speakers have also commented on the lack of specific proposals for financing or delivering change in the owner-occupied sector. Indeed, that was highlighted at the very outset by Pauline McNeill. Owner-occupied homes account for three-fifths of Scotland's housing stock and two-thirds of the houses with poor energy efficiency. Reducing heat waste from a million owner-occupied homes cannot simply be left to the market if we want to make a real difference to energy efficiency overall. And I think it is up to the government to bring forward effective fiscal and financial mechanisms to provide incentives to owner-occupiers and to put milestones in place uh, to measure progress. The Minister said the right time to think about many of those questions is after 2030. We believe that is simply uh, not soon enough. If energy efficiency is to be treated in a par with other national infrastructure priorities such as transport uh, and electricity networks, then surely that requires action to improve standards across the board. As Citizens mm -hmm. Advice Scotland put it, the national infrastructure priority designation implies a wider scheme of new support, both financial and an advice uh, provision for all consumers. So we acknowledge that the government's Energy Efficient Scotland route map does indeed point in the right direction, but we on this side will continue to call for greater ambition and for the resources to go with it. Designation as a national infrastructure priority must be about more than words. It also requires action and ambition to back up those words, and that is what we will vote for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Don, Donald Cameron, who goes for the Conservatives. Eight minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin by referring to my register of interest in relation to residential property and renewable energy. Um, I welcome the opportunity to close this debate for the Scottish Conservatives, and I view this as uh, an extra step in ensuring that Scotland continues to lead in green technology improving the energy efficiency of our homes and helping to reduce the cost of energy to our constituents. As we begin to debate wider issues relating to our relationship with energy, particularly on the matter of the Climate Change Plan and the proposed Climate Change Bill later this year, 2018 does indeed have the potential to be a landmark year. As colleagues across the Chamber have already noted, we welcome uh, the publication of the Government's Energy Efficient Scotland route map and look forward to continuing the debate on this matter. I would note with caution, however, that all too often we've seen reports which talk a good talk but often fail to deliver in practice. And this report must not be one of them. But I would like to credit the government for uh, the approach that they've taken. And like others in the chamber today, I want to stress that while we welcome the need to take action and view this as a starting point for a wider debate, this report does lack in ambition and in some cases appears to roll back from earlier suggestions from the government. On this side of the chamber, we have been adamant and consistent in our calls for ambitious targets in, relate, in ensuring all Scotland's home, homes meet the EPCC rating by 2030. It's a call that we've made in various speeches in this chamber and outside it, and we put that directly to the government. But it's also a call that's been backed by other parties and organisations such as WWF Scotland. There's a widespread view expressed this afternoon 
uh, from uh, opposition parties that the SNP government's target that all Scottish homes will achieve an EPC rating C by 2040 is a decade too late. And as Sarah Beatty Smith of WWF Scotland has said, homeowners must be supported to take action to upgrade their homes faster uh, than proposed if we are to meet existing and future climate change targets. Of course. Stuart Stevens. Um, I, I, I think uh, the member's colleague, uh, Mr. Burnett, properly said there are difficulties with the EPC see definition uh, and I know that my house couldn't be warmer but will never because of its construction meet the standard and I won't be alone in that regard is it not the case that we should have a better definition before we hook our target to it now the government's equally guilty by the way we're only talking about different years so it's everybody Donald Cameron. Well, I, I thank Mr. Stevenson for that intervention. I mean, I believe that there is a review and there is a, there is a, a healthy debate about the utility of the EPC rating, which I, I simply don't have time to get into. But what I would say to him is that, um, you know, I represent the Highlands and Islands and, and I accept that there will be properties um, in, in my region which will never uh, reach that standard. And we're quite explicit in our amendment uh, to say that this, sh this should happen where feasibly possible. And the government's um, language in the route map is, is similar, um, to be honest. It, it speaks about it being technically feasible. Um, Laurie McElroy of Existing Homes Alliance Scotland added that this must be done well before 2040 to effectively tackle fuel poverty and climate emissions from our homes. And the simple fact is that with almost 1.5 million homes rated below uh, EPCC standard and just over 400,000 homes in bands E, F and G, this is a pressing issue and deserves swifter action. A much starker fact emerges from the National Registers of Scotland, um, and this is a tragic fact indeed, that 2,720 more people died in the winter months of 2016-17 compared with warmer months. The WHO suggests that around 30% of those deaths could have been avoidable if everyone in Scotland lived in a property which was adequately insulated and heated. And with all that said, it is important, in our view, that the government reviews its targets and commits to ensuring uh, that all Scottish homes achieve an EPCC rating by 2030. But we recognise that in addition to government being more ambition, it needs to better inform people about the long-term benefits of investing in energy efficiency in the home and to inform people about the schemes available to help them. For example, Citizens Advice Scotland notes that energy discount schemes offered by local authorities have received poor uptake. And the reason for this is a portion too, amongst other things, a lack of awareness. And I have to say, this was an issue that emerged during the debate, that we have a real problem communicating uh, energy efficient schemes to the wider public. Results from a Freedom of Information request that we submitted showed that Section 65 of the 2009 Climate Change Act, which requires local authorities to establish an energy efficiency discount scheme that offers a one-off council tax rebate, for householders who carry out um, energy efficiency measures has given out just £20,000 over 10 years. Um, we believe that this is not uh, an impressive record, but it does reveal that there is a real information problem and the government needs to ensure that its agencies and indeed local authorities are making people aware of these schemes. I agree also with my colleague Graham Simpson, uh, who spoke about rural proofing, and I, as I've said already, as a Highlands and Lions MSP, I'm acutely aware that there are many rural and remote properties which present different challenges to properties in urban Scotland. Issues such as the age and design of buildings, the difficulty in insulating them, the fact that they're often exposed to far harsher climates, and many of them are not connected to the main, main gas grid. I think Scotland and, and the southwest of England have more properties than anywhere else off, off the gas grid. Uh, Liam MacArthur spoke about a particular issue in, in Orkney. Um, the other point that Liam MacArthur made, and it is an important one, is that the, the route map does not include um, evidence of rural proofing and island proofing. And that is a very salient point, Deputy Presiding Officer. We are about to legislate uh, for island proofing in the Islands Bill, and I um, sincerely urge the Minister to take this into account with the upcoming legislation that, that he's, he's mentioned this afternoon, irrespective of, of the Islands Bill. It's often easy, Deputy Presiding Officer, to get bogged down in the aims and statistics and targets that reports such as this often necessitate. 
However, the actions that we take will have an impact on communities and people that we represent. And only last week, I had the pleasure of chairing the cross-party group on health inequalities, and we discussed the issue of fuel poverty at great length. And the presentation from the Energy Agency was particularly poignant because it highlighted the immense benefits to people's health and well-being from making homes more energy efficient. And in each example, the, um, individuals who received upgrades to their property reported saving money on their bills and feeling warmer. In one instance, a man indicated that his respiratory problems had improved and that he'd visited hospital on fewer occasions. These are just anecdotes, but it is clear that it, there are immeasurable benefits to improving energy efficiency. And also that um, cross-party group gave very impressive evidence about public engagement, about directly going to patients in hospital waiting rooms, uh, etc. And I think there are significant lessons to be learned in terms of communicating with the public. And it's time to reach out, as others have said, as Pauline McNeill and John Scott have said, about reaching out and going directly into communities face to face to spread the word. Um, I don't have uh, much more time, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I, I would like to um, uh, commend the government on their strategy. We don't feel it's ambitious enough, uh, but we all think uh, that the benefits of diversifi diversifying the way in which we heat our homes has the potential to help us reduce our carbon footprint and make greater use of Scotland's natural resources. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. And I call on Wheelhouse to close for the government. Uh, Minister, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to thank all members for their con contributions to this debate. While there may be disagreement at the end of today about the pace and the uh, uh, mechanisms by which we deliver energy efficiency in Scotland, I'm at least heartened that there seems to be consensus that we are doing the right thing, if not agreement on the, the way we're doing it. But I take a lot of positive points from today's debate that people are, are trying to be constructive, trying to encourage us, if anything, to be more ambitious. And, and obviously, we uh, try and do our best uh, as a government to do that. And I'll try and reflect as many of the points that have been raised to date as I can. But before doing so, uh, I just want to reiterate the Energy Efficient Scotland route map is not the end. It does mark the beginning of the next stage of our journey on making our homes and buildings warmer, greener and more efficient by 2040. I think it's worth reiterating uh, that what we are committing to through the Energy Efficient Scotland route, uh, route map as a government uh, and the benefits that our programme will bring to the whole of Scotland. So Energy Efficient Scotland is uh, a significant cross-government programme which responds to our designation of energy efficiency as an infrastructure investment priority. Uh, it was a good point that was made earlier by Graham Day that uh, of the Cabinet Secretary, myself and, and Mr Stewart here, we are not climate change ministers. We are here because we are doing our bit uh, through energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient Scotland for our efforts to tackle climate change. And I, I thank him for his warm uh, remarks in that respect. Uh, but we're helping to tackle fuel poverty also, clearly. And that's been uh, an underlying theme throughout much of today's debate and clearly motivates us all as uh, either regional constituency, MSPs, uh, trying to help our constituents. And I can understand the strong sense of urgency about tackling this. Uh, we also want, though, to tackle uh, the need to deliver sustainable economic growth. And it is a shame, I think it was a point that was made by Stuart Stevenson, that the uh, whole economy figure of 10 billion was wiped, uh, is wiped out potentially by the Conservative Amendment because it's important to stress this is not just about public investment. This is about private sector investment, it's about businesses, householders investing, it's a whole economy, public, private and third sector cost of 10 billion over the lifetime of the programme. And that's, I think, is, is a mistake uh, to, to remove that from the, the motion uh, because it's a clearly important uh, factor in underlying the success that we may achieve. I'll give way to Mr Scott. John Scott. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention. And can he confirm that it's still the government policy, the spend to save policy, and that there would be essentially this whole programme would pay for itself by the reduction in cost of the health service were it to be brought forward more quickly and, and you would achieve so much more by doing just that? Minister? What, what I would agree with Mr Scott on is that the energy efficiency investment is a great example of preventative spending. Uh, I think that's, that comes across all the speeches today about Im Im impacting on health, impacting on educational outcomes with school children obviously having a better environment to study in and so forth. We certainly recognise that and, and I, I would acknowledge that it's a classic form of preventative spending uh, in investing in energy efficiency and it's important to do it and that is one of the reasons why we are driving forward our energy efficiency uh, targets. Uh, but um, the route map outlines a proposed framework of national standards for energy efficiency of buildings that we'll put in place as well as the support we'll provide. 
It is a truly cross-sector approach to improving the energy efficiency of both domestic and non-domestic buildings. We've not had much focus on non-domestic buildings today. But for Scotland's homes, we want them to be improved so they achieve at least energy performance certificate rating of Band C by 2040. But as I set out earlier, there are milestones on the way and our prioritisation is on fuel-poor households and private rented sectors, social rented houses in the early stages of the programme, moving into non-domestic uh, buildings as we move through uh, 2020s and into 2030. So uh, I want to reassure members of that, that we are very much targeting those houses, those properties that need to be tackled first. And on the point about rural uh, properties, I do accept um, some of the, uh, the points that were made earlier on, but I want to highlight there is a specific case study in the uh, route map uh, for a property in Ballater, which may be of interest to Mr. Burnett, um, uh, Mrs. R, Ms. R, who's in there. And so we clearly have set out some examples, and I will give some examples in a moment, of some of the initiatives we're taking in rural Scotland to give members confidence that is very much a focus of our work. Um, I, I need to make progress, but if I can keep it brief, please. Mike Rumbles. If the government loses the vote tonight about the targets and ex uh, increasing the targets, ex accelerating them, will the, will the minister actually implement what Parliament wants to do? Minister. I, I'm, I'm relying on my uh, persuasive skills today, Mr Rumbles, that I hope that I'll persuade the Liberal Democrat group by the end of this debate to, to vote for the government uh, motion and to reject these uh, in, inappropriate amendments. And, I regret Mr MacArthur's amendment was not taken, but clearly I got a mention from Mr Burnett, so I'm sure, I'm sure that was a positive, a positive thing for him. Um, but uh, we are clearly, uh, I want to emphasise the point, I think there's a number of uh, issues, perhaps about presentation here, that, uh, that we have to make clear. It's £146.1 million being spent in the current financial year. That is an ambitious level of, of spending, £500 million over the four years to 2021. It is a £10 billion whole economy programme, or maybe up to £12 billion. That is a significant scale of ambition for our economy and for all the stakeholders in the economy. So I want to reassure members, we, we believe after consultation we've got the right amount of uh, ambition. Uh, notwithstanding, we can always adjust as we're going along, as I'm sure we would, as we're reflecting on progress as we try and achieve our targets. But we are putting the appropriate resources in place to deliver an ambitious programme. I hope that reassures members on that point, regardless of how today's vote goes. Uh, that we are playing, placing area-based schemes at the heart of our approach and creating a framework through local heat and energy efficiency strategies to support local government prioritisation and targeting. And myself and Mr Stewart working very hard to work with uh, COSLA to try and uh, develop a, a programme of activity to address some of the concerns members have outlined about communal properties, mixed tenures, uh, the difficulties of trying to deliver a programme. Uh, Graham Day's example was an excellent one about how sometimes funding can uh, itself drive a bit of inefficiency if it's, if it's not coordinated properly. So through LHEs, identifying the appropriate technologies in each location and identifying the best way to deliver, we hope we can drive out those inefficiencies. Uh, the new towns, for example, good, good places where we've got commonality of housing stock, we can maybe learn from rolling out uh, pilots in these areas as well. So uh, there are lots of um, uh, areas in which we can improve efficiency and make sure in these early years that we identify the best technologies, the best delivery methods, the best way of coordinating our activity at local ground, at ground level to ensure we get the best bang for the, the public bucks and also to make it as attractive for the private sector and owner-occupiers, private landlords to, to take part as well. Uh, two examples of rural, in rural Scotland are both Care and Housing Association with support from our area-based scheme loans, improved energy efficiency and heating systems of 25 homes in Albert Street from EPC Band D to EPC Band C and residents have benefited, benefited from warmer, more efficient uh, to heat homes with customer satisfaction rates of 85% and in Stirling a programme was undertaken with PV solar panel installations, picking up Mr Ruskell's point and member uh, John Scott's point around so solar panels in California, demonstration of potential for alternatives the standard grid connected model of powering and heating our homes. So there are good examples of rural projects. I really am pressed for time, Ms. Beavis. I apologise. And, a bit and to while, you're, while you're taking that pause, can I? It's very rude not to listen to what the Minister has to say. It's very interesting, so pay attention. Thank you very much, Please presiding continue. officer, as always. Um, I also want to highlight on the non domestic front, we have uh, relaunched um, the uh, SME loan fund for, uh, for small businesses and uh, address members to perhaps win favour with the local constituents by pointing out there's a cash back on those, those loans so they can, uh, they can gain uh, an incentive to, to invest in energy efficiency and we see small businesses across the country already benefiting from that. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the budget issue I wanted to address to Mr Ruskell but I realise he only had two minutes in his closing speech so I don't want to steal his time but uh, in respect of the budget against the whole economy cost I, I pick his point earlier about ambition but I hope he now realises what we're referring to in terms of the overall scale of, of ambition in the programme. Uh, we do believe LHEs will be a very important part of the, of the, the uh, framework that we are taking forward to make sure that we coordinate our activities, as I say. In terms of the uh, actions around tackling fuel poverty, 
want to highlight that in, we are proposing in a consultation that all homes with fuel poor households should reach EPC band uh, C by 2030 as I say and uh, important to stress band B by 2040 so we're going beyond band C to try and make sure that the, those households are affected by fuel poverty as Christina McKelvey uh, outlined and I want to congratulate Christina McKelvey for the work she's done in her voucher uh, proposal with Scottish Power and other, other agencies that's a very welcome initiative. But this ambitious target will act as a guide for our national area-based fuel poverty programmes, and I hope that again will give a structure. No, to what sorry, we're doing. it's getting too loud again. Members just coming, and it's very disrespectful to the members speaking. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in respect of the uh, page, page 40, the case study I referred to earlier, um, we will obviously reflect on the points that are made about rural, rural Scotland and, and, and take that away. But we are working very much on the basis that this is an all-Scotland programme, that we are targeting fuel poverty wherever it is, and I want to give people an absolute reassurance that, that is the case. Uh, obviously, a number of points around the national infrastructure priority. Uh, obviously, we've identified now the half a billion pounds to deliver that national infrastructure priority, and uh, the SEAT programme was referred to in previous programmes for government is now called Energy Efficient Scotland. So um, I hope that uh, ties that one up so you can see where the funding has come from and why it is now uh, uh, identified uh, a programme to deliver that funding in practice. A number of references to needing a one-stop shop for energy efficiency, uh, started by Alexander Burnett and, and taken up by others. just want to emphasise the point that Kevin Stewart made very well earlier on. Home Energy Scotland is a very useful tool for us all in helping our constituents. And I, I do believe that members could help us and help their constituents by advertising that. It is a simple system to use and they will provide excellent service uh, to constituents. And uh, I'll just finish, presiding officer, and, and just emphasising that this has been a very positive debate. Uh, the route map that we have set out uh, last week, the First Minister launched at the Oil Energy Conference, is an, a bold, ambitious, but importantly, a deliverable programme, one that has been modelled and we believe it can give confidence both to the supply chain, but also to investors, whether they are householders, businesses uh, or, or the third sector. But thank you very much for your attention. I've uh, enjoyed the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, the debate on our route map to an energy efficient Scotland. It's now time to move to decision time, which is now. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is Amendment 12140.1, the name of Alexander Burnett, which seeks to amend Motion 12140 in the name of Kevin Stewart on a route map to an energy efficient Scotland be agreed. Are we agreed? No. Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask members to cast their vote now? They voted yes, 64, no, 60, there are no abstention. This amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is Amendment 12140.4 in the name of Polly McNeill, which seeks to amend Motion 12140 in the name of Kevin Stewart on a route map to an energy efficient Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their vote now. They voted yes, 64, no, 60. The no abstention, that amendment is therefore agreed. The final question is that motion 1214 in the name of Kevin Stewart, as amended, on a route map to an energy efficient Scotland be agreed. Are we agreed? No. We are not agreed. There'll be a division. Members who cast their votes now.
They are voted yes, 65, no, 59. There were no abstentions. The motion, as amended, is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time, and I close this meeting of Parliament.